session. This is the uh, uh, Thursday, April 11th uh, meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, we um, opened at 6.45 and went into an executive session. We're now back in open, open session. Um, <coughs> We, the next item on our agenda is actually an organizational issue on our rules, and we're actually going to move that to the end of the agenda um, and move right into our public comment period. Um, we have a list, uh, and I will be keeping the time. The first speaker is Jeffrey uh, Bubar. If you could just state your uh, Jeffrey Bubar, 35 Fruit Street. G building in Northampton. I'm aghast that parents of kids learning to swim here at the Aquatic and Family Center aren't here. Lap swimmers aren't here. We are in a nice partnership with the rec department. But unfortunately, a budget squeeze may force us to close the pool on the weekends. This is totally unfortunate. It will impact me, who uses it for cardiovascular and cholesterol fitness. It will certainly impact all the youth swimmers that are using this pool. I had a discussion this morning with some of the officials of the rec department. I urge them and also Superintendent Salzer and to get together and see if we can come up with a good funding plan to make sure that we have custodians on weekends. So this nice cooperation that's taken place in this building since 1996 continue. continue. It's a good facility. We'd hate to see it shut down and close. By the way, I am 100% for the altar of the override. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bubar. The next uh, speaker who signed up is uh, Lori uh, Davis Delano. Thank you. I'm Laurel Davis Delano, and I'm a parent of a student that's in uh, that went to Jackson Street, then went to the middle school, and then went to the high school. I'm also a long-term member of the Civil Rights Committee, when we used to have a district Civil Rights Committee, and also um, then the Jackson Street Civil Rights Committee, then the middle school, and now I'm uh, at the high school. Um, our Civil Rights Committee did try to get on the agenda tonight. Um, I don't know what the problem was, but there was some problem, but we'd like to get on the agenda another time. And the issue that uh, I wanted to raise tonight is the lack of teachers in the Northampton public, lack of teachers of color in the Northampton public schools. This is a huge problem. It, it results in reinforcing and sometimes creating stereotypes and negative messages about people of color in terms of them not being leaders or intellectuals. Um, and it's not only a problem for students of color, it's also a problem for white students in terms of uh, role models. Um, I hate to say this, but in my opinion, many people in Northampton, including in the public schools, talk the talk pretty well in terms of saying they support racial diversity. But there's not a lot of people who walk the walk that actually take measures to try to accomplish things like increase the uh, percentage of or numbers of students of color. And because we do so little, um, the result is we pretty much see no improvement on this issue. Um, and there are many, many strategies that the civil rights committees talked about and other people could talk about at all the phases of hiring that can be used. <coughs> we do use some of those, but we don't use most of them. And right now there's an opportunity because the school committee and committees that you all appoint um, are going to be hiring three principals, are going to be hiring a new superintendent. And it's essential that the viable candidates not only are, can talk the talk, but actually know the strategies that can be used to increase the number of teachers of color in the schools and are willing to use their social and political capital to make that happen, you know, their power, in other words. And so right now, I think that we'd like to see from the Civil Rights Committee perspective that all four of the hiring committees have people of color on them, 
that all four of the hiring committees have people that understand the issue enough to be able to assess the candidates, that all four of the committees have uh, a decent set of questions, but also people who can interpret answers to those questions around this particular issue. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who did not sign up who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we'll now move into announcements from the school committee. Any announcements? Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll move on then to the um, consent agenda. And we have um, the consent agenda tonight includes the approval of the minutes of the school committee of February 28th, 2013, March 14th, 2013, uh, March 28th, 2013. Uh, there's also some. Oh, March 28th. <coughs> oh, um, I'm sorry. March 28th was scratched. I apologize. Okay, so March 28th is not part of that consent agenda. And then I'm gonna just borrow this for a second because I misplaced mine. We have some contracts. We have a uh, $7,500 uh, to uh, Susan Donovan for technical assistance and training and staff in the student information system, Starbase. Uh, Ford of Northampton, uh, $43,898. This is the purchase of uh, the replacement grounds dump truck under the capital uh, plan. Um, and then um, a, a $59,443.99 contract to XT Development Corporation. And this is for the purchase of the new uh, student information uh, system to replace the outgoing Starbase system. Uh, the also have field trip requests. We have an NHS uh, girls uh, track the pen relays April 24th through 26, 2013, and then the JFK uh, trip to the Bronx Zoo May 22nd, 2013. Is there a motion to accept the consent? Oh, one modification on the contract, the X2 Corporation contract that you have. Um, Due to all the other paperwork you're going to get tonight, uh, included the sales tax. So the real amount for that is $56,776. So it's actually $2,667.99 less. Okay. When they gave us a quote, they added in sales tax. I have to take that out. Um, so that's just what I did. Okay. So uh, with that modification, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'd like to um, remove of the minutes um the one and i don't know which one it is because i don't have them in front of me right now but when i was reading them at home it stated that we accepted a check from ryan road school for six thousand dollars and we didn't they withdrew it before ever presenting it and so i i, I okay. can't um, find my minutes really quick so then why don't we uh hmm i'm uh, sorry i apologize for not okay which one. so why don't we um we'll move that one uh, is it the February one or the, I just don't know which one you're asking me to take off the consent. You know, and that's the thing, because I, I was reading it on my computer. Okay. okay. Where is it? March 14th. March 14th. <coughs> This isn't the right one, though. Okay. So which ones are we doing? So is, are, are we, do we have the, um, we don't know which one you w wish to amend. No, I just know they didn't give the $6,000 debt, the gift. That's February 14th, but these are March 14th. Okay. I didn't know that they never gave the gift. That's all I wanted to okay. state. Okay, so March. Oh, okay, so March 14th is what's on the agenda, but the minutes say February 14th. Even though it is no, these are February 14th. I'm sorry, they must have got. Because I must have sent the wrong one. Okay, it's the week after this one. We have the wrong one. And you have the right one. So it's February 14th. Which is the ones February 14th? I'm believing it's the ones after February 28th. It's probably the, because the this is 14th. the one, yes, the March 14th ones would have had where everybody else gave the gift. And then at the last minute, Ryan Road chose not to, and it wasn't because presented. Okay, okay so the minutes that you're raising questions about are not before us this evening, is that correct? I thought they were because I thought they aren't the February, they aren't March 14th minutes? No. Okay. We don't have, okay. Okay. So if you've already approved, if you've already approved February 14th, then we've already approved that gift. 
Well, no, the gift was after Alden's. We had we were trying to approve the minutes after it. I knew it came the week after the, the session after this, but I guess it's not on tonight. So, just so I just want to be clear: Are we okay with the consent agenda reflecting the 28th and the 14th? Is that an accurate assessment of what we're asking people to approve? We can't approve the March 14th because the February 14th minutes have pending. Okay. So we'll so we'll we'll remove the March 14th meeting from this agenda as well, and we'll just be the motion would then just be on approving the February 28th minutes, and we'll have to come back with clarification on the others. So would someone make did someone make a motion yet to approve the consent agenda? No, I now took that it we, out. So I, I can I move to approve the consent agenda? Okay. Thank you. As revised. Exactly. As revised. Exactly. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So those other minutes, we'll get that cleared up and get it back to you at the end. <coughs> so February 28th, by my reckoning, was the only one we approved tonight. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is reports and recommendations, and we will first turn to our student representative, Sarah Moss Horowitz. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, April vacation is coming up, it's next week. Um, we have two groups um, of high school students who are abroad right now. Um, the, there's one trip that's going to Turkey and one trip that just left to France and Spain. Um, so that's exciting. Um, tomorrow is the Battle of the Bands. It's an annual fundraiser um, for the high school arts. Um, and that is tomorrow night from 7 to 10. Um, Alice in Wonderland is another student-run production, and it is April 25th to 27th. Um, what else is going on? Um, at the end of this month um, and the beginning of May is Pride Week, um, which includes a bunch of different events. We have, there's a, an assembly um, with a group called Out Now, which is a Springfield-based um, LGBT program where people tell stories about coming out and um, the whole school is invited to come. Um, there's a play in addition for Pride Week, um, a play called The Wrestling Season is being put on on Tuesday, April 30th in the Black Box Theater. Um, the Junior's Parents' Night for College Admissions is coming up. Um, for art, there is a student exhibit at Forbes Library um, for all Arts Night Out. Um, that's an annual thing, and so that's the month of May. Um, Special Olympics are going to be at the high school um, May 9th, and that's hosted by Best Buddies. Um, it brings in um, students from kind of across the region um, and we have a lot of volunteers who help with that. Um, there's also an improv fundraiser on Friday, May 10th. Um, there's also coming up May 1st a movie called Journey into Dyslexia um, which is sponsored by the Special Ed um, Parent Advisory Council um, May 1st at 5.30. Um, so yeah, that is a brief summary of things going on at the high school. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that report. Yeah, that's a very good um, report. The next item on the agenda is a proclamation uh, that I'm delivering this evening as part of the Week of the Young Child. Um, and I believe uh, Barbara Black is here. So I want to acknowledge her for helping us coordinate all these Week of the Young Child activities. I was at the Parents Center earlier this week doing another proclamation. So this is a quick proclamation. It's called Proclamation on Brain Building in Progress Week. Whereas the Week of the Young Child is an annual celebration established in 1971 by the National Association for the Education of Young Children to recognize that children's early years lay the foundation for their later success in school and life and whereas the Department of Early Education and Care and its partners have declared that Massachusetts will celebrate the week as Brain Building in Progress Week, and whereas research demonstrates that more brain development occurs during a child's first five years than at any other time in a child's life, 
and whereas a high-quality early education nurtures a child's cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development and helps build a solid foundation for future success, and whereas investments in young children in their early education have a lifetime impact on young learners in terms of greater academic readiness and educational attainment, greater earnings, better health, reduced crime, and reduced need for social services, and whereas the Commonwealth has responded to this growing body of research by laying a strong foundation for a statewide system of high quality early education and care, and whereas the purpose of Brain Building and Progress Week is to add to this momentum by focusing public attention on the needs of young children and their families and by recognizing the early childhood educators who meet these needs, be it therefore resolved that I, Mayor David Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim April 8th through April 15th as Brain Building in Progress Week in the City of Northampton and urge all citizens to recognize and support the needs of young children and families in our city. So, uh, Move to approve. I, I, it's actually, I think I'm just proclaiming, oh. so, um, <laughs> Good uh, certainly. <laughs> Thanks, and we'll deliver the proclamation to you, Barbara, okay? Okay, the next item is a report uh, from Superintendent Salzer on school safety review. Thank you, I thought it was time to give an update on our school safety progress. Uh, I wanna give you some suggestions and explain to you some of the changes that we've made. Uh, school safety is an annual part of our work. We do the drills the lockdown drills, tornado drills, fire drills, it's all part of our work. But of course, after the Newtown tragedy in December, our group got together and took a much closer look at the security of our schools. We met with the police department and with our administrative team, and I wanted to give you an update on the results of that work. At the high school over April break, uh, the cameras, there will be additional cameras installed, and these cameras were gifted to us from the police department and uh, because of capital planning money, we were able to pay for the installation, so that will occur next week. One of the things that comes up every time we do a drill is that the staff, staff members uh, suggest that they don't have the keys or the appropriate locks on their doors to, to lock themselves in, and so we need to increase the key distribution for all faculty and staff, which is something that we can do and, and we often do. <coughs> It never lasts, so within a couple of months, somebody's lost the key, somebody's misplaced the key, some lock doesn't work. And so it's about 1% to 2% per month, according to Dave Pomerantz, that we lose these keys. The best way to have a locking system is to go the way that all the hotels of the world have gone with the swipe card, and to make that kind of a change is about a $300,000 estimated startup cost if we're to do that district-wide. So obviously that's out of reach for us. We know that's the ideal, and someday we would like to do that. Until then, we'll be replacing keys as often and as fast as we can. Uh, our administrators had suggested that we need more walkie-talkies. Um, these would, this would increase communication in and throughout the building, but also for people who are out supervising the playgrounds. We need about 12, which doesn't sound like that many. Uh, some are replacements, some are additional, but they're $300 per unit, so we need about $3,600 for these 12 walkie-talkies, and that's something that's on the top of our list. Another item that we are reviewing is the signage around the school so that all the outside exits are labeled, so if there's an emergency, a student needs an ambulance, we can call it in and say, go to this building, doorway G and the ambulance will know exactly where to go, but we have to label those inside and outside. And though they've done a lot of work uh, with the signage in the buildings, it's not complete yet and we're still working on that. The, the debate for the high school buzzer system uh, is one that continues. Some people would really like to see all the doors locked except for the front door and have a buzzer system just like the other buildings. And then those working within the high school feel that that's very impractical and uh, students are coming and going through many doors in the building 
So we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to increase the security of the high school entrance. Uh, when people get afraid, they start to think of everything uh, that could harm them. And so when you look at some of the buildings and the windows that can be seen right from ground level into the classrooms, um, there's talk of how could we keep those teachers and those children safe from somebody who was outside the building looking and in, intending to do harm. And really the only way to do that is security curtains, um, fireproof and maybe bulletproof window coverings that a person could push a button and slide down those curtains. They're very expensive. The cost estimate is actually unknown. Um, but I wanted to report that uh, because some teachers have, have discussed that vulnerability that occurs in some of our schools. Um, JFK and Leeds schools have both, asked, have both asked for us to consider the configuration of the entryway. So um, as you know, when you come into JFK here, there isn't uh, an easy way to see who's coming in. Of course, we have the buzzer system that they can take a picture and they can see who they're buzzing in. But as many of us know, that sometimes you come to the building as somebody's leaving, and so you just grab the door that's open and come in without getting buzzed in. And in the office, they don't have a window into that hallway. So really just asking to knock a small hole in that wall and put in a window so that the office staff and Leslie Wilson would be able to see into that hallway. And the same is true for Leeds. Uh, one thing that is in place and uh, we are very grateful for, the police department has brought back the adopt a school program for the elementary schools and there are four officers assigned to each of the elementary schools. Um, this will help build a relationship with the police that is lost due to the retirement of Al St. Ange and so these police officers will be coming to faculty meetings and coming to school events so that kids and faculty get to know them and begin to develop that relationship with them. Uh, Captain Scott Savino is the one who put this in place and we are very grateful that he has taken those steps to help us out in that area. Uh, last month and uh, earlier this month, the police have used three consecutive Saturdays at the high school to review their drills. They go in the school, they lock it down, make sure nobody's in there, and then they do their intruder drills um, and they have just completed that. So those are among the, the many things that have been suggested about school security, I wanted to share those with you. Obviously, I can't share everything with you, and we also try not to share these documents as public documents, which is why I'm reporting it to you rather than handing it out tonight. Any other questions that people have um, about the report of the superintendent? Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is a report from the Rules and Policy Committee. Uh, sub -com oh, excuse me. We have a gift. Excuse me. A gift of $1,000 from the Phi Alpha Foundation Incorporated. I don't know if someone wishes to. I move to accept the gift. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, so this is, again, a, a very generous gift. Um, it's to support science fairs at the JFK Middle School. Um, and it is uh, from the Charitable Foundation of MIT alumni. Just keeping in mind Ms. that May. when you accept the gift, yes. you accept it to the general fund. Exactly. Right. Sorry, did I take the words out of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we're just yeah. right. the gift, we have to the make sure it's to consistent. The gift. Yes. We accept the gift. We'll hopefully spend it the way they want it to. Yeah. Right. There are no I was just reading the letter that they yeah. submitted, yeah. Okay, so there's, a, uh, is, there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the gift is gratefully accepted. The next item on the agenda is a report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee uh, on emergency field trip requests. The Rules and Policy Subcommittee met uh, to discuss request from the athletic director uh, specifically, although it could, I suppose, affect other groups. Uh, this would be a um, concern about, it, it, in order to do out of state or overnight field trips, it requires the approval of the school committee. In some cases, uh, there isn't sufficient time to get the request to us at a meeting before the event happens, particularly in sporting events where the students make the finals and they're supposed to go next weekend or whatever, or 
for example, the robotics thing where they compete and they, again, qualified for the finals and it comes before our next meeting. So um, understanding that there are occasionally times we were looking for some um, way to get approval for those field trips without waiting for one of our meetings. So if you have policy number IJOA. You should have received it late this afternoon. I apologize for short notice, but um, I would read to you the one sentence, if you didn't get it, if you don't have it in front of you, I'll read to you the one sentence that we are trying to add under approval process. Uh, it currently states for out-of-state late night or overnight trips, advance approval must be granted by the school committee. We are looking to add the words in the case of special circumstances where school committee approval cannot be obtained in time, approval may be granted by the superintendent or his or her designee. So I would move uh, approval of that revision to the policy on field trips. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded by Ms. Pick. Um, any discussion about this? Uh, I just have a question. I'm sure this has come up, and that's why it's come before us this evening. What is the current process and procedure when this occurs currently without the policy being in place? <laughs> there ain't one. It but requires, the, it requires the school still committee. Still in place on occasion, I would imagine. Just recently. Well, gosh, we might. I would hate to think we were in violation of our own policy. <laughs> so that's <laughs> why you have this change in front of you. So, so that's right. the procedure. Right. Okay. I understand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about the policy change? Um, okay. Uh, I moved that and somebody else seconded it. Ms. Pick seconded it. I realized that we typically do two readings of policies and this would be our first reading so it's probably not even really supposed to be a vote tonight except for the fact that it has okay. been of late an issue and a concern for us. So if it's, we I don't know. We, we could, could suspend the rules, right? Though. Yes, we can, we can suspend the rules and do it on one reading if the um, committee believes that it's important. Enough. So Mr. Flynn has made a motion to suspend the rules. Second. 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 So all those in favor of suspending the rules requiring two readings on a rule change say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, and so now we can return to your motion uh, to approve tonight, if, if, if you'd like to renew that motion. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, and so then the motion would be to approve this rule change. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any objections? Any abstentions? Okay, so the motion carries and the rules are amended. Thank you. Policy is amended. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda uh, is the. Um, is the FY14 budget. <clears throat> and I will uh, turn it over to the superintendent and Mr. McLaughlin uh, for their presentation. While you are receiving your books, uh, the way we're gonna make this presentation tonight, uh, first I wanna mention that the conversation we had two weeks ago uh, where I highlighted the changes and we had that discussion, there have been no changes to the budget since that discussion. So those decisions were final as of two weeks ago. What we did then was put it into this booklet. So what I would like to do is, you know, for the people at home who don't have a book in front of them and the people in the audience, I would like to read aloud the superintendent's message, which um, leads into the development of this budget. And then I will ask Mr. McLaughlin to walk us through the booklet uh, in summary fashion uh, in less than 15 minutes, uh, leaving room for uh, you to ask questions. And before I do this, I want to make sure that I acknowledge and thank Mr. McLaughlin for the very hard work he has done the past 10 days of 12 and 14 hour days, which includes Saturdays and Sundays, um, were put into the development of, and the very important accuracy of this book as it went to the printer uh, late yesterday afternoon and we received it back this morning in the nick of time. <coughs> so thank you very much for all of your work on this. With this budget, we present the responsible, balanced, yet austere FY14 school budget. This year, our city's financial need required us to build a budget incorporating many significant cuts to personnel and services, along with an increase in some school fees. 
After months of analysis, conversation, public presentation, and challenging decision making, our administrative leadership team is putting forward this balanced and responsible budget which will preserve the core of our quality programs and services. And I am seeking a vote of approval to pass this budget forward to Mayor Narkowitz to include in his overall FY14 city budget. Thankfully, within the last weeks of preparing the budget, we received an additional allocation of $450,000 following the confirmation of savings from our health care package. Because of this funding, combined with additional and very generous support from the community through PT PTOs, VINs, NEF, and individual business donations, we are able to continue many rich learning opportunities for our students. Though I will be leaving my position at the end of July, I continue to be a strong advocate for the students in our schools. In last year's message, I stated, though today is not the time to ask our families for an override, uh, the conversation has begun. That conversation has turned into action, and our community is working to organize, promote, and campaign for an override to support the continuation of all of our high-quality programs and electives. I cannot predict the outcome, but know the community will advocate for our families and children with passion and commitment to build the vote to increase our city's resources. Together, we will work toward a future where our school system can reach the successful educational result we desire, consistent with our core values, mission, and district improvement plan goals. Since last year, we have made significant upgrades in technology infrastructure that supports 21st century instruction in the classroom. We also continue to examine and restructure our programs to offer high quality learning for our students with disabilities, English language learners, and every one of our highly valued students. And the following pages detail our funding sources, past trends, and our spending allocations for FY14. Thank you, and I turn it over to you, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you. The budget book you have in front of you this year is very similar to the one that we gave you last year. Very similar in breakout. Um, charts are going to look uh, similar in many cases. Uh, the numbers are changed. Uh, but um, I would like you to uh, flip the page and we'll move through this. Um, if you flip one of those tabs, uh, you'll get to the next page that says core values, mission statement, uh, theory of action. These were the core values that we changed and adjusted in our, our uh, school improvement plan, or excuse me, our district improvement plan. So just to keep that in mind uh, as we go forward. The next section is uh, the summary version of the budget changes. As you can see, we're up to version 10. So you can see the administrative team has come back together 10 different times to make changes to our numbers, uh, looking at everything uh, from um, staffing changes to uh, non-staffing changes. So this sheet here you have seen in the past, um, pretty much the same in format. Um, some of the uh, percentages of staffing changes and dollar changes have uh, been adjusted. So we, as, as an increase, our budget needs our increase was 773,403. Um, our adjustments to balance out those, uh, that increase is on the next two pages by building, so you can see where all the adjustments and the changes took place. If you keep on moving, the, uh, the next section you have in your budget book is the chapter 70 preliminary summary. This is from the Department of Education website. Um, this is a chart that I think breaks out for the committee that you can see all that we receive from the chapter 70 or the monies from the Department of Education is just a little over $7 million. Even though our total budget to operate a school is 28 million, we only receive 7 million through the Chapter 70 funding. The next page, if you flip that page, you're going to see the trends in a graph form uh, from 1993 to 2013. Uh, you can see um, the trending as it just inches up each year going over time, and you can see the differences between Chapter 70, foundation budget, net school spending, and the actual spending of funds that is put forth by the community to educate the students here in Northampton. OK, 
Okay. If we flip to the next tab, which would be projected enrollment. This is the F, uh, this is the FY 2014 projected enrollment. Um, this, this is broken out by the different class sizes as we know today. Again, keep in mind that everything that's in this book is two to three months ahead of where we were last year. Last year we were still doing a lot of this work in June. Because of the charter change, everything gets moved up of three months so we can stay in line with the rest of the city. So as you can see here, these are the projected numbers as we know them right now, right today, with the best information available. Behind, uh, after that, the next tab, which is also an important tab. It goes into school choice and the residential student enrollment um, as it sits right today. So this gives you the chart of where we are right here, right now. Um, I know the data at this point was as of January, but this is this fiscal year you're looking at here. So you can make a comparison to where we are in the prior tab of projections and you can compare it to um, where we sit today. So you can, you can make your own uh, comparisons um, as you wish. Behind that cover page of school choice, uh, you have uh, a five-year school choice summary. And this takes a different slant and a different view of the numbers. It's broken out uh, through incoming students coming into choice and outgoing students uh, under choice. So as we are this year right now, we have 222 students coming into our district as part of our school population, and we only have 64 leaving our district through the choice program. The next page in that same tab is the school choice seats that are opened and filled. Because this chart is a little bit earlier in the cycle process, you notice the far column for 2013 and 14, we have 59 openings in this fiscal year, or excuse me, next fiscal year, but right now we have not gone through the full process to fill those positions, those openings, I keep wanting to say positions, openings, sorry. The next page behind that is a nice summary version of uh, school choice trends in enrollment. This comes off the Department of Education website. Their numbers of FTEs and uh, might just vary a little bit, up or down one or two from the numbers we have, but I think it's the way they calculate and how they view the FTEs um, when they're putting together the information based on the end of year reports and what gets reported to them through all of our financial reporting. So this, for the most, for the purposes of this chart, you see the breakout of the dollars of receiving and the dollars of sending. And you also have a bar chart to the right. The page behind that just gives you the one snapshot of this fiscal year of FY13, shows you the amount of dollars. It also shows you when um, it, the number of students that we had in December, what we count in March, and what will be in June. So you also can see the quarterly payments that are made uh, on our behalf for the receiving students and also the sending students. So this mixes a little bit of payments along with total dollar value and the students that we're paying for either sending or receiving. If you flip to the next tab, I know everybody has seen this before. This is the, the historical comparison of the budget from 2002 to 2014. So you can look at the local appropriation to the number of students, the teachers, a student to teacher ratio, the amount of chapter 70 aid that we have received during those years, what's been reported to the Department of Education as part of the net school spending, and whether we're over or under that Department of Ed target.
Okay. If you flip to the next tab, the next tab is a average per pupil cost. This, this, this particular chart is a mix of information off the Department of Education website and comparisons that I have made with other school districts on the big areas that we all talk about, um, whether it's um, percentage of teacher cost or professional development or guidance or out of district expenses. And I compared them to other communities that uh, we talk about a lot at our meetings in di different discussions when we try to stack ourselves up against uh, how we're doing. And when you sit here and look at this particular chart, you'll see that we stack up pretty well against all the other communities. In some areas, we're right on the average of these 10 or 12 other communities that are listed. In some cases, we're below. Um, one case, I think we're above. But um, it gives you a better perspective to know how we're managing our money overall as we stack up to other communities. The chart, if you flip that page, the chart right behind that, again, a landscape format page, this is just our total expenditures per pupil, and it just puts it in a graph format. But the one thing I wanted to point out was if you look in the, t the upper left-hand corner, the total district in district FTE average membership is 2,704, but all the monies that are going out either to charter or choice, we have 312 students leaving, so the total number of students um, when the Department of Ed looks at us and makes comparisons, um, we have a total FTE average of over 3,000 students. So the DOE changes and mixes uh, different numbers uh, on, their, on their site to make comparisons that are meaningful to them, but I wanted to at least put this here to you so you could see how we're being viewed by the Department of Ed. The chart right behind that is basically a, uh, uh, a historical chart that gives you the long-term trends of where we have been from pre-K all the way up to uh, K, uh, 12th grade. It gives you a bar graph at the bottom um, and all the uh, different uh, enrollment levels by each grade. If you flick, flip to the next tab in the budget book, you're going to get to a portrait um, page that says comprehensive budget. The top portion of that page is the total expense portion of our budget of what we're ex expending. I left FY12 compared it to where we are in 13 into the to the right hand side is a proposed FY14. And again, that's the total amount of dollars and total amount of FTEs that are in those buildings to support the educational process that goes on at each location. Just below that is the total availability of funds. So if you look right under each of the, the subheadings there, you'll see appropriations. And if I go to the far right column, FY14, you can see that for local appropriations, you have 24522768 But in addition to that, we have a bigger pool of money that impacts the education in our schools, which is uh, all the grants that are listed here. And then there's another section that says all other funds. So when you take the grants of $1,396,340 and you take all of the other source of funding, which is $2,695,050, um, our expenses and our source of funds balance out. So when we go through the um, budget process as administrative team, we have to make sure that our incoming money matches up to what we're going to expend during, this, during the year. Okay. 
Next tab. I know in the past you've seen this particular portrait page. It talks about school choice funds. And you can see the number of positions that are in the budget that are purely supported by our choice money uh, that we receive in our district. So you can see the uh, dozen or so staff members that are paid uh, out of this account. You can see other expenses uh, that include everything from unemployment compensation to uh, Medicaid auditing services to other expenses that have come out of this choice account and a number of utilities that we take out of this account. Okay. The next section, I don't want to go into the, the detail, but it's the thickest section in the book. It is the individual line items by school. Uh, it gives you um, the particular description of the account. It gives you the amount and the balance uh, that we will be at on June 30th. This particular uh, spreadsheet is extremely, extremely large, and I've had to crop this down to fit on this document for you folks. But the, a couple of things to remember is as a result of our negotiation, if you looked in the heading of the uh, first numeric column that talks about June 30th, we add the 1% at the end of the year. That was a negotiation agreement. So I wanted to properly reflect the 1% increase uh, that was going to happen on June 30th. So when we started FY14 on July 1st, that increase would be there as we evaluate and look at each of the staff members, whether they're moving up a step, moving over a lane on the chart, or um, receiving a negotiated uh, cost of living increase. I don't want to go through all of these pages, but that is summary headlines. You can, at your leisure, go through and look at these. All of these pages here roll up to the comprehensive budget. So the tab or two before what you're looking at right now is the total roll-up oh, of these 40 or 50 pages in this particular section. So all of these roll up by school and they all roll forward. If you flip out of that big section of each of the individual schools, the next section I would just like you to take a look at is the, salary, the salaries in other operational line items that are being expended out of the grants. I know I've showed this chart to you in the past, um, so you can see each of our grants. You can see the amount of funds that are used to uh, support the school by the positions. I did not put every line item here because we have some line items that are professional development. We have some that are for contracted services for uh, professional development. There are other monies in the grants, but I wanted to make sure you knew and that you could see the amount of staffing that the grants support throughout the district. So that's what these two particular pages show you. If you go to the next tab, this is a new tab that I've added in this year because of the change again in charter and because of how we reviewed the uh, capital plan. I know Mr. Zahowski and myself sit on the capital committee for the city to look at and review uh, projects that are brought forward by all departments within the city. So what I wanted to do here is uh, show you the actual write-up. I believe uh, two months ago I shared this information with you, but I wanted to make it as part of the formal package. So you can see that there are other funds outside of grants, outside of other funding sources that supports the school. And that's what this section is demonstrating right here. After that, in a landscape uh, page um, is a historical analysis for you folks to look at on fuel costs, broken out by the building, broken out by gas, electricity, water, sewer, and 
I know there's various reasons in past history of we've had warm winters, we've had cold winters, um, other kinds of things. The numbers do go up and down. The rates of uh, those uh, fuels and uh, utility uh, commodities uh, rise and fall uh, throughout the year. But this is just a historical comparison so you can see how much of our budget really is used to uh, uh, heat the buildings for uh, all the students and all the staff that reside in the buildings for eight, nine hours a day. The next, the next tab is just a comparison of FY13 transportation and how that compared to FY12 and FY11. Again, it's, it's broken out as to the cost of how we pay our regular ed transportation bills, how we pay our special education transportation costs, and how much it costs us to transport uh, um, students <coughs> under the McKinney-Vento Act. And the, the last tab or the, is the unemployment costs. I know this is one tab that you had seen before and I just wanted to continue that. But this is a, uh, a summary of 2003 to 2013 of our unemployment costs and how we pay them, how much is paid by the month. So you can at least look at uh, where we, where we land at the end of every year with unemployment. Um, I do want to point out that in FY13, in the month of October, that is truly a minus sign because uh, uh, that is a correction that was made during the course of the year. Uh, there was uh, some adjustments that uh, we were overcharged in September and August that had to be corrected in October. So that's why the month of October shows it with a minus sign in front of it. That is all the document in its entirety. These are the type of information that we look at when we are in our administrative team leader meetings. Uh, these are the type of things we grapple with uh, on a weekly basis when we discuss the budget and when uh, we're making our decisions as to how to change, modify, or improve our, our district. So that's your FY14 budget. To begin, I would ask um, so that we could move this onto the floor for discussion and, and a vote. I would ask for a motion um, to approve the superintendent's uh, uh, recommended FY14 budget for the Northampton Public Schools. So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. So now I would open the floor to any questions or discussion or comments that people have. Obviously, we did we sort of did cover and ask a lot of questions at our last meeting about this proposal. Um, so I, I and this is sort of now the full version reflecting that. Um, I don't know. Uh, well, I wonder. I know that you have the first. I was going to ask a, just a quick question. Just I know that you had done a review at the beginning, similar to um, sort of the version ten. I, I don't know. I think it might be helpful for folks who didn't tune in to the last review to maybe mm -hmm. just quickly review uh, what some of the cuts that needed to be made to get to this budget. Uh, that I'm not sure, just for me, it might be helpful just for us to review that quickly or go through that. Do you want me to go through the list of them? Uh, I, I, I think it might be helpful just to review that again. I know we've talked oh, about it in the like previous reading this list, but okay. I will. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, we um, had to make $773,000 worth of cuts to our personnel and services this year. And in order to do that, uh, we needed to eliminate, um, and I'll start with district wide and then I'll go school by school, eliminate a full time special education department position. That's a secretarial position. We had to eliminate a full-time special education teacher at the lead school. We are going to need to increase the food um, for food service. The lunch prices will go from 250 per student to 275. We will need to increase the athletic fee for students at the high school, going from 150 to 175 per sport. 
We have made attempts to reduce our out-of-district tuitions and to reduce our special education legal expenses. We are going to ask the PTOs to cover the total cost of the nature's classroom, which includes the overtime for ESPs who need to accompany children with disabilities on those field trips. Uh, we are recognizing that though we have a total of 27 people retiring from the district, that's not just teachers, that's in all areas, that we do not factor any savings from the retirements because there are always costs uh, to pay out when people retire. And then the rehiring process um, often leaves us at a net zero. We have reduced uh, central office administrator, the director of academic effectiveness, uh, from a full-time position down to a 0.5, and we will ask them to work on the grants. So we've cut the PD work, the professional development work that that position does. Uh, we are looking to eliminate uh, one full-time custodian, and where we predict that will come from is uh, 0.5 of that position, from us not funding the custodian at JFK on weekends. And as I've said before, we are hoping that the Parks and Rec Department will be able to fund that position so we can continue the programs on weekends, just that the school department cannot fund that 0.5 any longer. And uh, there will be another 0.5 reduction, and that will go to the lowest member of seniority. Within our schools, uh, we've had to reduce some teachers, and of course, we're doing some increases as well. I'll just hit the reductions uh, right now. We're reducing a 0.5 classroom teacher at Jackson Street School, and we'll be uh, eliminating a certified occupational therapist, and also eliminating a 0.6 uh, evaluation team leader at Jackson. At Ryan Road, they have decided to reduce the professional conferences teachers will be able to attend, and therefore are able to cut the budget for substitutes who fill in for teachers while they're at professional development. We will reduce the physical education teacher at Ryan Road from a full-time position to a 0.8. We're going to reduce the clerical overtime, and we also had to eliminate 0.5 evaluation team leader in special education. Over at Leeds, we are eliminating the full-time library media position. We are eliminating a 0.5 evaluation team leader uh, teaching position in special education. We'll be eliminating a 0.4 uh, speech and language pathologist and uh, reducing the school psychologist by 0.2, but also we'll be increasing a different position by 0.2, so that's a net zero at Leeds. Over at Bridge Street, we are reducing the front office secretary from 86% to a 55% position. We're reducing professional conferences. We're reducing a full-time speech language pathologist. We're reducing a uh, second position in speech language. Uh, we'll be increasing some um, part-time positions at Bridge, and then also reducing a psychologist from 70% to 60%, and reducing the ETL evaluation team leader in pre-kindergarten and kindergarten from 1.0 to 0.5. Over at JFK, we're eliminating a full-time general music position. We're reducing the math interventionists from full-time to 80%. We're eliminating, and this is through a retirement, uh, and one ESP. We're reducing the art teacher by 40%. We're reducing a speech-language pathologist. This is there are two positions that total 1.2 FTEs that will go down to 1.0. Uh, we're reducing the psychologist position from 80% to 70%. We're reducing the life skills uh, staff. We're reducing uh, staff and transferring someone from guidance. So that will, that, that's through bumping. So if somebody <coughs> is coming from a position that's being cut at another school, bumping into that position, then that has a net result of saving a certain number of dollars. And we're also reducing uh, full-time uh, special education ESP. Over at the high school, we're eliminating 50% uh, of the technology curriculum teaching position. We're reducing one of the art teachers from full-time to 50%. We're reducing the technology video photo teacher from full-time to 50%. Reducing the music band teacher from 83% to 34%. Reducing the choir teacher from 67% to 50%. Reducing the theater teaching position from full-time to 83%. 
reducing the consumer science teacher from 67% to 50%, eliminating the stipend for the cheerleading coach, eliminating school supplies, a total of $24,000. We are, uh, there are small increases, as I mentioned, in uh, some of the part-time positions in special education. In addition, we'll be eliminating a 0.4 speech-language pathologist at the high school, and then most significantly, uh, well, I guess they're all significant, but most significant to some families uh, is the transportation eliminating busing for students in grades 9 through 12. And that is how we reach our, uh, that's how we close our budget gap. Okay. Are there other, are there questions or comments? Mr. Meyer. I'm just curious about the collapse of Title I and Title IIA funding. I'm just really struck by the fact that Title I funding is down by 20 percent and Title IIA down by 43 and a half percent. And again, since the federal government is the only government that can deficit spend, I just wonder if you'd comment on was that a, was that a global thing that affected all communities across the Commonwealth? Was this a, something specific to our, our grants that we wrote for those? programs. Ms. McLaughlin, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Uh, that is clear across the entire state. Uh, I had received a email from the Department of Education that reminded us to ensure that we adjusted all of our federal grants accordingly and reduce them down um, as a result to uh, the reduction of federal funds coming into the Commonwealth. So all of those changes or those reductions of monies reflect that advice from the Department of Ed. And is this a trajectory that will get worse over the next fiscal year? I'm not sure we I can predict. Can't, I, I can't predict that one. You can well, predict how the federal about, government, like, though, whatever. <laughs> we'll welcome you to do that. <laughs> was this a notice related to the sequestration? Or was yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've gotten similar notices in the Housing Authority and other places about these same kinds of reductions. You know, again, just for uh, the people watching this, that those those issues seem far away and that maybe they're outside of our control. But um, it's it's sixty thousand dollars from our Title One funding um, that goes to fund education for for low income students, and it's fifty thousand dollars. I'm sorry, it's $50,000 for Title IIA, which is for teacher quality and training. And again, that's an area which we have cut drastically over the last 10 years is professional development. Part of the reason it happens is that the federal government committed when they gave us No Child Left Behind, which we still are, have, are burdened with those testing requirements, they committed to give us money to train and improve the quality of teachers in our system, and <coughs> the money disappears. So just so the people know that um, there are things that are outside of control that are driving reductions in services which we feel are necessary. The money disappears but not the requirements. No. Yeah. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. That's an important point to make because sometimes we're watching TV about the, you know, the frustrations in federal government trying to get a budget passed and many people don't always connect it to somebody who's teaching their child in school. So mm -hmm. thanks for bringing that up. We're going after the E rate, but it'll come through in our telephone bills, our communication. It gets take. They they used to be able to generate a check, and they would give us a check. So we would show that as a revenue coming in as a revenue source. But since we file with them the amount of expenses that we. Uh, incur through, you know, T1 lines and all the other forms of uh, communication. What it, what will happen is it's going to get reduced off of our our bills that we receive from our vendors, whether it's Charter One or whether it's Verizon. So our bills will be lowered as a result of that, um, and that would show up in our normal operating costs. So that's why the telephone number went from forty-three thousand down to thirty thousand. Correct. That's for that. Okay. Right. Give us a credit now. Right. right. Yeah. Minnick. Sort of unrelated, but have we had any opportunity to have discussions with the Red Department about the possibility of their taking on the cost of the, of the 
custodian so that the pool could remain open. I haven't had, I haven't been able to have that conversation yet. Have you? <laughs> Other than, you know, I've obviously expressed concern at these meetings about that, and I know the rec department is concerned about that. Um, and it's a, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's tricky because obviously the custodian is here for other things in the building as well on weekends, other school uses, other, um, and so, you know, whether there's an ability to have, figure out a rec department staffing that could help support the building on the weekends or not, I, you know, that, that becomes problematic because there's other functions and contractual obligations. So it's something we're gonna have to work through, but it's a, it's a concern particularly because of the fact that the, uh, you know, JFK is used so heavily on weekends for the pool, for basketball, for other rec programs, and this is going to present a challenge. Um, and their fee structure doesn't currently support that, and obviously we're trying to make the fees affordable for all families in the community. Um, uh, you know, so that's the, that's the dilemma. I know the rec commission has been discussing this, but we don't have a resolution. Couple comments and questions um, to kind of fall over. So the the first thing that I'd, I'd like to point out is people at home cannot see what the um, projected enrollment page looks like, and I I have to commend you that what we can see from the elementary school, the numbers, the class size numbers really look excellent, and there, there's. Um, it's very hard when you look at this to know anything about what's going on at the middle school and the high school because it's not broken down by classes. And so um, one of my questions about that is, um, do you have any sense what's happening to the middle school and high school classes given the number of um, um, block and uh, exploratory at the middle school and um, um, electives at the high school that are being reduced? What is the class size looking like in those buildings? in the academic areas? Uh, I don't have the answer for JFK. However, at the high school, I've been talking to Principal Nancy Athis, and we are going to, uh, Howard Moore has requested to sit down and go over those numbers so we can have some talking points to bring to the school committee, because I believe that other people have those same questions. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna take a look at the impact. It's much more complicated at the high school and the middle school because obviously the variety of schedules and offerings but i think it's an important question that people deserve an answer to so we'll be getting that information to bring back to you so i, I just i feel a little difficult to me not not to know you know when we're voting does that mean that we're voting that we now have 35 kids in a particular high school class or um yeah, you do have to remember that some of our high school classes have 35 i, I do know right. that i do know that and that's not not generally a good thing um, at the elementary school, can you tell me, um, and I think you've answered this before for us, but I'm, I'm not remembering the answer. What does it mean that uh, the elimination of the ETL positions in the, in, the, um, in the elementary schools and who will be covering those duties? Lori Farkas is sitting in the back of the room, and Lori, I would like you to have an opportunity to answer that question. So, Ms. Pick, if you would come up to the microphone so the people at home can hear you. Um, we're talking about the elimination of the ETL positions in the elementary, and of course that will require a shift in work. Uh, and if you wanted to just talk through that briefly, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, primarily, um, what the elementary ETLs do is a lot of scheduling and organizing of meetings. Um, that will be taken over by someone in my office. And um, another thing that they do are initial team meetings as well as reevaluation team meetings. They chair team meetings. Um, at this point, uh, Pam Plummer, Barbara Black, and I have been at many team meetings. So we've actually taken a lot of those responsibilities as at the current time. Um, those are the major points. Um, in some cases, the uh, special ed teachers will be taking some smaller pieces of their responsibilities. Do you mind if I ask you a question? No. no. So I'm remembering a number of years ago how pleased we were to put those ETLs in place um, <laughs> to um, reduce the, the workload of the staff that was in the buildings. Um, and what I remember from, from um, the SPED pack is that they were concerned that um, it, the reason we brought those in is because they were concerned that there, there, were, there wasn't enough P 
people time to actually do all of that scheduling to attend all of the meetings. And so I'm wondering, with reduced staff, how is your office going to manage that in all of those buildings? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, my primary objective, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part of what you said. I'm sorry, I was being facetious and thinking Harry Potter that you could be in two places at once. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, actually, my, my primary goal was to uh, preserve the staff that, that serve students directly. That was always my goal in any of these cuts. And so with that in mind, um, it, if we have to take on a, a greater load in the office to deal with some of the administrative pieces, that may be what we have to do because to me the most critical, the most essential people are the ones who are serving kids directly. So I know that's not a perfect answer um, and I think uh, the feedback I've heard from the PAC so far this year is that people are pleased with the level of communication that's going on between um, staff and parents. Um, we have almost no rejected IEPs right now in the district where when I came here, we had a stack that was about a foot high. Um, and so I think um, I've worked very hard to change the tone and the level of communication between parents and special ed teachers just in general. And so I, I hope that difference will kind of morph into next year as we have a shift in staffing. It's, again, it's not perfect, but in having to make cuts, there are, there are things that we've had to do. So um, just a two-part two um, follow-up to that. Um, we know that every year at budget season we cut out ESPs and then somewhere in the summer we have to scramble because we find out who's coming into the district and we need to put them back in. And so I see that already there are some coming out. So I, um, I would ask you, and this is putting you on the spot here, when you look at your um, your budget and your plan for next year for your department, what are you most concerned about? What should what what do you think that we need to be watching out for most closely? Um, first, I just want to respond to to your first statement, and there, to the best of my knowledge, unless I've missed something in going over this a number of times, there is one ESP on that list, and that's all. The retirement, all right? And that person is retiring. I think that's uh, really putting her on the spot maybe an unfair question well, at this point I mean, to ask I, her I, what I, she's going to miss the most. Uh, yeah. So I want to intervene to that question I because what's what very most, difficult for us to do is when we take any one of these positions mm -hmm. and ask us how are we going to how are we going to live without that position. Um, it's very difficult to function without any of these positions because the cuts we're making this year um, are severe to the services and the programs for our kids. Uh, so there isn't one thing on this list that we actually can function well without. Uh, we just have to make do with the money that we have. So to respond to actually to that first part of the question is that this year I really, we are making time to plan out where our ESPs will be before the school year ends. So we have, we can look at where we have any flexibility so we don't end up in a position of cutting people on that only to rehire them back at the beginning of the year because that's not that's not good planning it's not good thinking and and I really hope that in going over the budget as many times as I have with with um, Mark and Brian that um, that we are thinking ahead and ha and we have built in some level in this very tight year of flexibility and again as as the superintendent said, there are no cuts that we want to make or that, that feel comfortable to make or that make it easier for next year. They always make it harder because we're always looking at having to work harder with fewer people to do the same thing. But again, I hope in changing the tone and adjusting some of the culture that, that we have um, that, that it, we, we end up keeping a level playing ground somehow. <laughs> it has coming much, into Ms. the Parker. district. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other 
Did you have more comments? I did, but I'll, I'll see for a little bit if somebody wants to go in and then I'll come back. Um, I'd like to just, on the um, analysis of fuel costs and just in vain of talking um, regarding the pool and the closing of the pool on the weekends, and um, I'm looking at the fees for the sewer, the water, the electricity, and the gas, and I guess I, if it were put on a um, comparison of square feet, then maybe I could interpret it better. But I was expecting that JFK having the pool would have a lot higher um, utility cost than it does. And in, also in comparison to um, the high school, I was very surprised the high school that doesn't have a pool you know, has higher and everything. And that's why I was wondering about the square foot and, and figuring out a way to figure out exactly you know, how much we're actually still paying for the pool and not suggesting that we take it out, but just as a, as a means of looking at it and trying to compare the buildings with the square feet and the square footage. I mean, such as Jackson, the water and the sewer is almost twice as much as, you know, the others or one and a half times as much as the others. And just wondering why and, and you know, so that's a comment I wanted to make there and I reserve the right to talk again. Uh, it's a combination of variables, square footage, ceiling height, Building use in the evenings, the high school has, the high school's going all night and all weekends with games, theater productions, robotics team building things. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more people in the building, more people using the building, the higher your utility costs will be. Jackson Street, as well as a very active and busy school, often open on weekends, and so that will increase the utility costs there. Thank you. I'm just going to go back to a specific staffing question. Um, I, I think we probably all abhor the cuts to the arts that we're seeing in the high school. But um, what I, I would question is, just so that I understand it, it looks like the majority of um, the arts are being cut to a half, well, half-time position. I'm just wondering why it is that in, um, in music that band is cut from uh, to point three, um, while well, theater is being cut to point eight, and I'm not saying that I favor one over the other, but it, it looks, I'm not sure I want to use the word inequitable because it's not about that so much. I'm just wondering how, how the percentages got decided upon. Uh, I, the answer to that is due to the enrollment, and so the number of kids that demand a course or a section of a course is how these decisions were made. And unfortunately, for band and choir, they will have a large section. So the band may have 60 students in it. And then you will have a jazz band or a smaller class that has 12 kids in it. And so we tried as much as we can to preserve the courses that are in high demand. And the theater is very popular. A lot of kids are trying to register for those courses. And so we had to provide courses for as many students as we could per section. So does that mean um, specifically that in, in band in high school that there will be a band, but there will not be a jazz band or um, the other offerings from instrumental music? Or do um, we not know I that? can't I say that, that specifically. Um, what I could say with confidence is that perhaps that .34 music teacher will have as many students as the .83 theater teacher, you know, because they have so many in one section. And so then um, my bigger question is, we're going to be talking a little bit about a, a proposition two and a half override, and um, um, of course we're we're voting on a budget before we know if we're going to have a vote and how it's going to turn out. We haven't heard numbers yet about what's going to be asked for and how much we would get and all of that. But <clears throat> I'm wondering if you and your administrators have, and I'm <clears throat> not looking for specifics right now, just in general, have you started? Have you talked at all about? Um, priority for how you would redistribute um, funds if we should have additional funds is that yeah, quite honestly that is our next step we uh, every ounce of time we've had for the last couple of weeks have been getting to this uh, budget gap and so our next step that we're very excited to take is to develop our priority list that if we get some money back where will it go first and that's that we haven't gotten to yet past when we've had cuts, what would be, if, and then there was the discussion of what would you do if you had, if you had got more money back, mm -hmm. 
and most often that's a list of the things that have been cut and they're prioritized as to which ones you would add back first. Um, I realize I'm only one member of the committee, but I would suggest that as you're considering that, you consider what's the best use of the funds that you have, not necessarily to replace or reinstate some individual item that's been cut, but rather what's the best use of the amount of funds that you find that you are, are going to be now extra funding that you weren't anticipating. And it may not be to exactly replenish the items that were cut. I just would encourage you to think creatively. Thank you. About what you need and what, what would best benefit the district. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Mike. I just had a question. When I look at the, um, for instance, the music choral teacher and a $9,700 position over a 10 month, $1,000, um, and I just, wonder how many people are we going to lose from that faculty and whether um, have you looked at other districts to see whether this model in fact works because it's one thing to write the number down but mm -hmm. if you lose the faculty member and you cannot in fact hire someone of sufficient quality mm -hmm. to carry out that job function for ninety seven hundred dollars you effectively mm -hmm. cut it not to you know point five or point three four but you've cut it to zero i'm just wondering in building this budget, did you look at other districts in our area that have done this, and have they been able to keep quality people teaching the arts yeah. at this level of funding? No, and to be honest with you, I didn't examine the surrounding district on that specific question. However, as I've mentioned to you before, uh, when you make cuts like this, either uh, these people stay and uh, at a reduced salary with the hope that their, that their position will be restored either over the summer or within the next year. But the other alternative is that these are high quality people and they will be taken by other districts to full-time positions, in which case we will we'll lose that person and we will most likely, uh, and, and we will be able to fill these positions. Uh, there are plenty of applicants for these positions, uh, not necessarily of the quality we'll be losing. So we'll be getting uh, young people who are willing to start out with a part-time job in order to get some experience in the teaching field. And that will be a, a likely result of these cuts. Mr. Ball. Um, I've received many letters from um, the community regarding the cutting of the arts. and. I've really been examining my conscience about it. Um, we do offer a high quality education with high quality programs and electives, and yet we're cutting into what I believe is, is critical for a child's education, to have a well-rounded education. And I understand how difficult it's been for the alt team and um, the superintendent, and the business manager to go through and to put together this budget this package and I think it's a wonderful package as far as it's, it's done really well and I appreciate the time spent putting it all together and the hard work there's kind of a little however um, I'm having a hard time thinking of being able to vote positively for the budget because it, to me it goes against the basic principles of, of just a free public education um, I, I believe it's missing um, the rights, civil rights of some of the students, but the, the lack of the busing, even all the way down to cutting a cheerleading stipend when there's other clubs and there's other athletics, and even though I'm personally not one that's ever done cheerleading, I think that it may be important to some people, and I have a hard time with just cutting that one. Um, maybe I just don't understand it enough. Um, I believe arts education is critical to leveling the playing field of student opportunities. I just, um, Arnie Duncan, the Secretary of Education, stated the arts can no longer be treated as a frill. And I really thought about that, and I listened, and I read the letters, and I've listened to people, and I've talked to people, and it's not a frill. To some of these students, this is the core of not necessarily who they are, but of finding who they are and developing who they are and, and learning critical thinking and learning acceptance of other people and learning about themselves. And I think that it's, we would just be doing such a severe 
detriment to our students to be taking out such a fundament, fundamental critical part of their education. Um, I don't know what else to say. I, I'm just having a really hard time thinking. I, I, I'm, I'm torn. I feel badly. I know how long the process has come. I know we don't have any funds. I know it's a matter of revenue. I don't think anything is being spent frivolous, frivolous, frivolously. And I do want to make a side note here that I really appreciate. And when I was watching um, the school committee meeting, because I watch it sometimes to make sure that I got everything and got the notes and everything. I want to appreciate. I want to just state that I really appreciate that the Holyoke Community College was not cut. The the letting students go over there. I know that Smith College does it for free, but the Holyoke Community College and what we're doing with those students for the I believe it was fifty five hundred dollars. I just like to applaud you for for having. I don't know the foresight, the compassion, the focus on civil rights because it affects the poor section and their ability to become who they can best become. So I did want to state that, that I, I, that was one, I mean, I know it's only $5,500, but I was really, really glad that as a priority that we kept that when that would be something that we could lose. But anyway, I, I do want to thank you all for working really hard on it, Mr. Salzer, Mr. McLaughlin, and, and all of the all team. Um, I'm just having a very, very hard time thinking of voting for it, and if I do happen to vote against it, I want you to say that I still appreciate everything that you've done. <laughs> it just goes against the basic core of, of what I believe our schools should be. And when I look at our, um, our, our values and our core values and our mission and even our theory of action, I think, how can I? And so that's where I'm stuck. So I just wanted to say that, and thank you. Are there any other comments, or were we ready to vote uh, to vote on the matter that's before you? Okay. Hearing none, I'll take that as a as a yes uh, to vote. So, all those in favor of adopting the superintendent's uh, uh, F proposed FY14 budget for the Northampton Public Schools say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. No. Okay. Nay. Uh, any abstentions? Yeah, okay. So we have, uh, just to make sure I understand the vote, we have. I think we'll do a roll call. Yeah, let's, let's call the roll just to be. <laughs> what if we all voted no? I mean, I think we're going to just see what happens no matter what. So if you call the roll, just to have it on record. Uh, yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. So the uh, motion carries, and the uh, and the budget is uh, is adopted, and uh, that will obviously uh, be uh, incorporated into the work that we'll be doing over the next month to put together this, the overall city budget. Just one additional comment: the the budget document that you have in front of you here within the next week, we'll put it up on the school website, so it'll be accessible for everybody else who wants to see this. Yeah. But anybody from the public who would want to review it is welcome to review it in our office. We don't have enough copies to hand out to the general public, but it will be available in our office prior to being on the website. Um, okay, so the next uh, item on the agenda is a discussion relative to Proposition 2.5 Override. Um, and I'm not sure what the that's on the agenda. Um, so I, I think I would make the statement that um, as many years as I've been on the school committee, this by far has to be the toughest budget I've ever voted on. Um, but we've discussed before that these cuts are things that are uh, on our radar.
radar and they're in front of us every year because we've identified a problem that uh, involves revenue and we can't sustain what we would like to sustain with the money that uh, is appropriated through the city. Uh, we also know the city has an extreme uh, problem with revenue as well that we continue to look at and try to find ways of solving. Uh, and so as we look forward to the reality of a budget that was just approved and what it will impact and how our students will be affected, um, it's uh, time to go back to what we heard the superintendent say in his budget message, and that is that the conversation about a proposition two and a half override hasn't just begun, but it's turned into action and our community has begun to organize itself and promote <coughs> and actively begin to campaign for an override to bring back or try to preserve those services and the education that our community so much appreciates and expects us to uh, make available to our students. And so with that, this evening, I would like to uh, begin a discussion here with the school committee on moving forward with uh, supporting an override that I believe will, in the end, yield money coming into the city of Northampton that the mayor will find uh, in his allocation to bring more money back to the schools and therefore help preserve or right now bring back some of those positions that we know have been currently lost. Uh, uh, Ms. Duvall and then Ms. Minnick. Are we going to vote on this tonight? I mean, is this a vote that, we, we, that we're doing or is it a discussion? Because otherwise I'd like to move that we actually vote on it to support the override um, and take that vote to city council. That's what I would like to move. But okay. if we're not voting on it and I'm out of place not knowing what I'm doing. Uh, I mean, I certainly. That's I, fine too. <laughs> well, I, I certainly, I, I don't, I mean, if, there, if there's a motion to have a sense of the school committee that you would be supportive of that, I think that that's, I mean, we had proper. I would like to make that motion, okay. please. Second. Okay. So then there's a motion made and seconded that the school committee would endorse uh, a, a proposition to, to an and a half. half override and take okay. that to the city okay. council. Yes, okay. the voters. And Ms. Pick, you had a question? Uh, no, a uh, comment. Um, just that I um, will fully support um, uh, a proposition to and a half override this time around. And I think I said this last time in general, I haven't I'd wanted to support overrides that aren't for something concrete, but I really don't see that we have a choice as long as the um, our tax formulas are the way they are and our funding sources are the way they are. If we're not going, this is the only way we have any autonomy right now in Northampton to um, to raise revenue to provide the services that we, that we need. And so um, I will support that and I will vote yes. And also just want to make a comment for anybody who's listening who might not be on the Yes Northampton um, email list, that there is an organizing meeting on Wednesday, April 24 at the Jackson Street um, Library at, from 7.30 to 8.30. Um, so there is already kind of a, a groundswell of activity happening to um, um, help make this uh, come to fruition. Um, so this would be a meeting to come to if you um, have the inclination to get involved and um, and campaign f for what we need here in our city. Sarah. Um, I'd also just like to comment on, so I know you guys are aware, like a month ago, um, whenever it was that um, students got involved slightly rebelliously. Um, and But one of the main things that did come up was um, kind of the issue of an override. And there is a strong stu student support, which is kind of unusual to get students kind of actively involved. So. Um, that is definitely something that students can help work on in terms of pushing it act, act about this meeting. Maybe yes. Exactly. Ms. Minnick, did you have yeah. a, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I absolutely support an override and, um, but I don't want to just make this seem like this is, um, this is what our solution is every time we get into a budget crunch. And I think what's important to recognize, and I know we've discussed it before, but 
this chart that's in the superintendent's report and where people can actually see it online, the Chapter 70 trends, you can see very clearly that here's the Chapter 70 form, uh, the funding formula, that this is what we get for state aid that just is flat right across from 1993, a couple of little peaks here and there, but pretty much a flat uh, trend that we see here, and we see what it actually costs us to run a school, and we cannot, we can't sustain that. And so this is not an issue of mismanagement of funds or that we, uh, our budget's bloated in places. Uh, this is truly a revenue issue, uh, but this has to be fought on a bunch of fronts. Um, obviously, we need to take care of our own right now, and that's where an override can come in because we can bring back funds that we desperately need in the schools. But this problem is going to continue until we really get sh uh, some strong advocacy at the state level. And we say this every year, and we, we have lots of really active people who go to Boston, who contact legislators, who do this kind of work, but it's not enough. We need to start connecting to other communities who are also feeling the same pinch because one community being loud and vocal and having a good organization is one thing. When you get a group of communities with a group of organizations, we make things happen. And this has to happen because if it doesn't, every time we get into a, a tight pinch like this, our only source of action is going to be looking for an override and dealing with a broken formula that we've it's been broken for, for a long time and it's about time the state addresses this. Well said. Mr. Bourne. I just want to follow up on that. You all might have seen the announcement from the MASC that there's going to be a legislative action day on um, May, uh, May 21st. I'm planning on going and Downey was talking about going too. So anybody else wants to join us that day? If not, we'll come back and report on what we find out and how we can advocate more strenuously at the state level. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I guess I just want to add, uh, you know, obviously I, uh, last week I did uh, I just want to just, uh, let this, put the city council on notice that I would be bringing an override order to them. Um, uh, I'm going to be um, submitting that order actually on Tuesday. Uh, we sh we're still, the House released its budget yesterday. Um, we still, uh, DOR has still not put up the local aid estimates based on that budget, so we're still working through a few of the numbers. But obviously my goal, is to, and I said to the school, uh, to the city council that, um, you know, I'm concerned about the level of cuts we're making, particularly in the schools. So my goal is to put forward a plan to the city council that will help us restore these cuts for FY14, but also provide a provide a, a way forward for the next several years to be able to um, uh, to be able to uh, allow us to maintain uh, level services. So I'll be giving more information about that on Tuesday. But I thank you for the school committee um, signaling its support in advance of next Thursday school uh, city council meeting. I keep mixing up the bodies that I appear before uh, the city council uh, because I think that will be helpful for them to hear that um, coming from their fellow elected colleagues. So, so there's a motion before you now um, uh, asking the city council to endorse a proposition two and a half asking over. Right? The asking the city uh, school committee. Sorry, there I go again. Uh, the school committee endorsing a proposition two and a half override. Uh, is there any other comments on that or? I just want to say one of the things is that Proposition 2.5 is supposed to limit the growth of public expenditures to 2.5%. Um, in the last six years, the growth of the school's budget has been 2.16%. We're actually below what 25 would allow us. The significant cost driver has been health insurance and which has grown by about 4.2%, which is pretty much exactly what the Bureau of Labor Statistics says inflation is for that area. And the city has just done what it can in order to reduce the growth of those costs by entering into the GIC, the General Insurance Commission. So um, proposing to. Proposing to, yes. So, um, so we've done everything we can locally um, short of an override. So again, it's the last tool we have. And when we go to the override, what we're doing is we are engaging citizens in democracy. We're asking them to vote on June 25th if it is approved by the council about what kind of city they want to have. And that's, that's not to make the choice for them or presume to you know, say what, they, what kind of pressures they have financially um, because you can read the headlines in the Gazette and see businesses closing and people being laid off. But it's saying let's give the people the choice 
Um, I would also like to say that we, we received that additional nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but um, uh, 450. I'm think, I've, I watch City Council all the time, so it's based on my information, it's based on the City Council. 450 and then the city overall. The savings that we're making from the insurance is, I believe, at the expense of all of the city employees because it's going to cost them all more. So um, I just just wanted to make that a note that I think it's a lateral shift of, of savings and, and expenses. Um, we're putting it on the the backs, the insurance on the backs of all of the employees of the city of Northampton while we're enjoying and reaping the benefits of the $450,000. So I just wanted to say that. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I guess then I would ask for a vote on the, uh, on the motion. Um, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the motion is unanimous, and obviously I will communicate that to the City Council um, next Thursday. Um, in terms of the agenda. Make an agenda change, that's fine. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm wondering, um, well, let's see. We, <coughs> why don't we do the resolution just because it sort of fits in with the other mm -hmm. two items, and then I would <coughs> want to see if we could move forward to the superintendent search before we do the, because um, we have some folks here for that. So uh, can we move on to the um, resolution in support of increased state revenue? Uh, this is a vote asking for a vote on a, on a resolution that was put together jointly by the uh, conference committee of the school committee and city council. Um, trying to find the language of that. Uh, and I wonder if a uh, Mr. Um, Meyer, would you like to read that? Uh, as a sort of as a motion, read the resolution to seek the council, uh, the city school committee's support. Yes, I would. Um, I'll just say that this resolution references two legislative um, initiatives. One from Gover Governor Patrick, who, who proposed a 1.9 billion dollar um, increase in taxes, a progressive tax, pa tax package to provide money primarily for education and transportation funding, and another, the act to invest our communities. In the time since the resolution was drafted, um, events in Boston have moved beyond this. So on Saturday, the Senate will vote for a much narrower transportation bill, um, which the governor has said he will veto because he's looking for a broader solution. Um, uh, and they've also, the head of the Ways and Means Committee in the House has expressed his belief that the governor asks, um, th though his sentiments were good, that his proposal was perhaps too large to be passed by the legislature. However, that doesn't mean that the, um, by no means are the questions settled, and so anything that members of the community can do to communicate what they would like to happen is important as this conversation moves forward. So with that, here's the resolution. Whereas beginning in 1998, there have been significant changes to the state tax code, including a series of phased cuts to the state personal income tax from 5.95% to 5.3%, and cuts in the tax rate applied to dividend and interest income from 12% to 5.3%. Whereas the net effect of all state tax reductions and increases since 1998 is that total tax revenue as a share of state personal income has declined by one percentage point from 6.3% in fiscal year 1998 to 5.3% in fiscal year 2012, amounting to a loss of $3.8 billion in annual tax revenue for the Commonwealth, according to the Mass Budget and Policy Center. Whereas this substantial decline in revenue has produced an ongoing fiscal crisis for the Commonwealth, resulting in deep funding cuts in essential public investments and compromising the state's long-term growth potential and the current and future well-being of Massachusetts residents. Whereas Northampton state aid has been cut by nearly $4 billion since fiscal year 2002, from $13.5 million in fiscal 2002 to $9.6 million in fiscal year 2013. Whereas Northampton has taken every possible measure to raise local revenue to offset the impact of state aid cuts, including the passage of a $2 million general operating override for fiscal year 2010, the adoption of local hotel and meals taxes, and increases in parking fines and other fees, including licenses and permits, water and sewer rates and trash disposal. Whereas Northampton has implemented dozens of cost saving measures and continues to do so, including consolidation of departmental functions, adoption of the municipal health insurance reform, implementation of major energy improvements and performance management systems. Whereas for the fiscal, two th fiscal year 2014 budget, Northampton currently faces another substantial budget gap, which will require more cuts to our public school system and city services. 
whereas Governor Patrick has recognized the critical need to invest in our education and transportation systems across the Commonwealth in order to preserve and build Massachusetts' economic and social health. Whereas in order to make that investment possible, Governor Patrick has proposed a $1.9 billion progressive tax package that would increase the income tax from 5.25 to 6.25 percent while doubling the automatic personal exemptions, decrease the sales tax from 6.25 to 4.5 percent, and eliminate a number of specific existing personal tax exemptions and deductions. Whereas State, Rep where State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz and State Representative Jim O'Day, along with our own State Representative Peter Kokot as co-sponsor, have reintroduced the Act to Invest in Our Communities, a bill that would raise $2 billion in revenue through a combination of income tax and capital gains tax rate increases, while increasing personal and other exemptions, making the tax code more equitable. Whereas the growing recognition that we can no longer expect local communities to preserve basic services without more state revenue make this legislative session a crucial opportunity to take bold steps for tax reform and investment. Be it therefore resolved, the Northampton School Committee urges the State Legislature to consider the proposals outlined above and adopt fair and equitable tax reform to raise substantial revenue, a sufficient portion of which shall be allocated to local aid so that the City of Northampton can continue to provide the level of public services its citizens require and deserve. Is there a second on, on that resolution? Okay. Um, and I would also just note for the record that the City Council also adopted a similar version okay. at its last meeting. Yeah, as did the Forbes Library Trustees. And the Forbes Library Trustees. Any discussion on this? Um, all those in favor? Uh, oh, sorry, Ms. Minnick. <laughs> um, I'm trying to formulate my thoughts here. Uh, I, I have some minimal amount of concern about this because it feels like border double dipping. It feels like we're going to the same people again and again and again to ask. So we just said that we were in support of uh, an, an, uh, an override <laughs> within our city, but this kind of a proposal, if the legislature moves forward and agrees with this, will result in some increased taxes to some of our citizens as well. So it feels a little bit I, I guess I just want to say I understand what we're doing. My, my sense is that this will be longer term coming and more far reaching, but it's also one of those things where, as you pointed out at our last meeting with the meals tax, we send some money away, but we only get a portion of it back. So whereas the, the override actually puts it leaves the money here in town. This, that's our taxpayers paying for things here. This is something that's on a different level. And I'm not going to say that I'm not supportive of this because I actually am very supportive of the state funding the things that it's supposed to fund. I just want to, to I guess I just want to say to people that I do understand that this is sort of like we're, we've, I've, I, I would understand if they feel like we just are coming after them for more and more tax dollars. But I think that having said that, this is our community and as the resolution itself says, this, these are the things that I think our community wants and, the, and deserves and they should be funded. So I hope that taxpayers will, in, rather than feeling beaten down, I hope they will understand that this is an opportunity to, pro to increase our quality of life and the, and the services that we offer to our community. Mr. Meyer? I, I just might add that the, both uh, acts are designed to minimize or reduce to zero the impact on communities like Northampton where the average household income is $55,000. What we have in Massachusetts is a regressive tax system because we have a flat tax so that, in fact, the lowest fifth pay a higher percentage of their income than the highest fifth in Massachusetts. <laughs> and the idea is not to punish communities like this, um, but to realign our, our taxation system so that wealthier communities actually contribute at least the same percentage as other communities. I'd like to address the idea of the double dipping. Um, ideally, for me, a, propo uh, a proposition two and a half override would um, go for a capital improvement, uh, something that's not just sustaining our schools. Um, and I believe that the bills that are presented right now and, and this resolution looks at the long 
the long term. And I think that that's the difference. I mean, it would be nice if, the, if we didn't have to do the Proposition 2 and a half override or if we had it for technology or, or something that would be a one-time expense. But what we're looking at is something, and that kind of worries me, is that we're looking at something that's going to be ongoing and, and the decline has been um, historical. I mean, since 2002, it's gone down quite a bit. Um, they have state mandates and federal mandates. We need to get the government paying for those mandates. And so I, I support the resolution and um, I just, it's unfortunate that it feels like it's double dipping, but I think the proposition two and a half is a desperate measure. I mean, we have to do something now and it would be nice if we could um, wait, but I just don't think we can at all. on this resolution? Okay. All those in favor of adopting the resolution say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The resolution is adopted unanimously. Um, I would like to ask the school committee's um, uh, support to move up an item on the agenda, um, the superintendent search item, if we could just move to that now uh, and just go through a uh, some updates on that. and. Um, and then we can come back to the regular order items if that's okay. Um, so uh, you were just given some written materials, albeit I noticed, and it's my mistake, what the top one has been, you, you actually received one in your inbox this afternoon that was an, an updated version and the one that was copied, that's my fault. Um, uh, but we, you, you tasked me at, my last, at the last meeting to um, put together some materials, work with the vice chair, work with the superintendent, uh, work with the HR department, um, and actually our HR director, Glenda Stoddard, as well as Sue Stone from the HR department are here this evening um, uh, to go ahead and put together some materials for, a, um, for what a search might look like. And so there's a few documents that you've received tonight that are, the first one is a superintendent screening committee membership. This is the, this is the outline of what a superintendent screening committee, uh, how it would be comprised. Um, the, ch the two changes I would note on the, ha the paper handout you were given is that the third item down should say NACE representative, um, and then the fourth item down should say community representative. Um, and that we made those changes in the electronic version you got, but it, uh, due to my error, it, it didn't get carried through to the, to the hard copy. Um, so this is essentially the same structure of the screening committee that was used in the last search. Um, and so we brought that forward to show you what a screening committee membership would look like. Um, the next item is, uh, is an ad uh, for placement um, of, of a superintendent of schools um, advertisement and uh, again based on the one that was done less than two years ago um, and uh, and has obviously in this case it has the HR department as the contact point um, uh, <coughs> and, um, using school spring as an online application point for people to apply the candidate profile is the third item in the packet this is a lar this is uh, again the same candidate profile that was developed um, for the previous superintendent search. Um, and, uh, and then finally, and probably most importantly, is a proposed timeline for a superintendent recruitment that walks through a timeline um, that, uh, that could have a, uh, an ad go out, have an application deadline, have a screening committee appointed um, uh, toward the end of this month, and then have a set of meetings of a screening committee um, that could begin to meet and then interview candidates and then you can sort of follow the timeline down. Uh, and this is a timeline that was developed uh, again wor in working with the school department and HR. Um, the other piece of information, and I was going to have the superintendent speak to this, that you asked us to do some work on was the issue of consultants and what, um, what was out there in terms of consulting possibilities as well. And so uh, the, there's a sheet that's been handed out to you um, and, and I was going to have the superintendent review those because his office did, some, did the outreach on those to get quotes from the various uh, consulting firms that are out there. Thank you. So uh, if you decide that you want to go with the search consultant, uh, we do not need to 
you, know, you can see the quotes in front of you. We had contacted five companies and got quotes. Uh, two of the companies did not get back to us, but we did hear from three, the Mass Association of School Committees, Hazard Young at and Associates, and NESDAC, the New England School Development Council. Uh, the good news is that MASC is something you already pay annual dues to. And as part of your membership, uh, you do have a lot of support for superintendent searches. So uh, they will give you advice and guidance planning your search. They'll help set up interviews and site visits. They'll assist in recruiting. They'll also offer assistance in finding an interim superintendent if that's necessary. They'll post the vacancy. They'll distribute the vacancy to um, the entire state network, school board associations. Uh, there's a whole list that's this bulleted sheet that's in front of you of advantages that you get for the fee that you already pay. So in the event we decide to go with our own search led by our HR department, you can have this support as well without any additional costs. However, if you go back to NESDEC, which is the search firm you used two years ago, uh, we were looking through that contract and I <coughs> Stephanie is the one who remembered well uh, that there was a clause in that contract that states if the candidate for superintendent uh, leaves for any reason within two years, either voluntary, voluntarily or involuntarily, that NESDEC will conduct a new search for that position and will provide consulting and support services at no cost except for advertising and the expenses payable. So on your chart, you'll see for NESDEC, the consultant fee of $12,000 uh, would be waived. You would only have to pay the expenses of $39.60, and they will pick up and lead the search again if you choose to go that direction. So, um, so and then obviously Hazard Young has a fairly large flat, flat fee. fee. It was the third right. quote that we received. Um, so. Uh, that's sort of the that's the the homework that you asked us to do since the last time we discussed this, and uh, I guess we wanted to get a sense from the committee on um, on what direction we wanted to take on this, and it may be that we can choose kind of a hybrid approach, um, uh, using either one of the consultants. Um, so I guess I want to open it up for any questions people have about the material that you've received tonight. Did you have a question? I didn't have a question. Oh, about okay. Material. I to make a okay. Did you want to make a comment? I did want to make a comment. Okay. I wanted to make a comment that um, when it was when I moved last time to move it for the Human Resources Department, it was when we were looking at fees and we didn't know the amount of money that would be the amount of expenses. Um, looking at this, and thank you very much. For, for getting this together. The fact that um, the same consultant firm or the same company that we used last time, the NESDEC, is waiving the consultant fee because essentially we've already paid it and the expenses are only $39.60. Um, part of me feels that, a big part of me feels that it might be more beneficial than going through our human resources for the most part because they went through the extensive search already and they were with us and we were with them and we, there's a working relationship. And the other thing is to, I would urge that we use what we do have available of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and that they have that, um, there's a, a list of a description of services, but I do know that we pay those dues and I think that we need to take advantage of that also. So um, I could easily be swayed to not use our human resources department if other people felt that way because I do believe that both the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and number three, the New England School Development Council, which helped us last time, I think it's a very nominal fee and, and, and might be worth it. Okay. Um, I want to say uh, that I actually would probably prefer that we use our own uh, human resource department. We, we went with NESDEC uh, and they blew the first search. Uh, we, we got all the way to toward the end and um, they didn't vet um, candidate all the way and we, we found out that someone actually didn't have a position that they said they had and uh, it, it slowed us down. Uh, we gained a lot of information in going through the process and developing um, our assessment of what we wanted in a superintendent and that was recent. I think we have that knowledge and I think it's still fairly fresh and I think we can expedite this process by using our resources. We can save some money and uh, 
I think one of the things that I'm hearing from constituents is that um, looking for candidates that have investment in the local community and what better way to gather that than to have uh, our local HR handle the search if we're not looking for people on a national scale or if we're hoping to have someone with more ties to Northampton or at least Western Mass then this would be an optimal way to go. Ms. Minnick. Um, normally I think Mr. Flynn is right on the money, but this evening I'm going to disagree wholeheartedly with him. <laughs> um, and I understand if he's representing his constituents, he has to do that. Um, my sense is that if we had been focusing strictly on staying within our local community, we wouldn't have had Mr. Salzer for the last two years, and I think he's been a huge benefit to this district um, and put us on the track to um, achieving a lot of things that we've been looking for for some time. So, uh, and, and I would respectfully uh, say that there was a, a, an error in the vetting of one of the candidates, but I wouldn't call that blowing the whole search. <laughs> but re, uh, it, it, was, it was not fruitful in the beginning, but it was, they continued working with us to find the right candidate, and it was a search that yielded a superintendent that I think the school committee in, um, has appreciated and um, respected. So uh, for those reasons, I think that it would not be wrong for us to, con to consider using NESDIC again. Furthermore, I think that it's Im if indeed, I, I do understand that there are some constituents who think that looking for somebody who's familiar with our community um, makes sense, and I agree that it ha that there are some that there is some rationale for that. It does make some sense, but there's also I I think that there are um, benefits to doing a wider search, and I just would hate to knock us out of the opportunity to find an absolutely perfect candidate who could know Northampton quickly and who would fit in to Northampton and who would care and be committed to this community. Um, and my concern with using our HR department is simply, very simply, the, the limitation that they have in an ability to actually recruit candidates. That's, that's something that a search firm can do that our HR department is neither um, equipped to do time or personnel wise and or networking what if they they don't have the network that a search firm that specializes in looking for superintendents would have so for that reason alone I really am, am very uh, what's, what's the word I'm, I'm, I'm it's getting late and I have a headache but <laughs> I, I am very, very much in favor of going back to NESDAQ and asking them to do the search, understanding that there was a misstep in our previous search, but I think it's something that we will watch for, and I'm sure that they will be extra cautious in dealing with us this time. Go ahead. I, I was just going to comment. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. My only, th and again, the only thing I wanted to just put out there is, um, is just the question about the time frame. That's the only, um, my, my only question is just that we think through that piece because we've tried to craft a very tight time frame. And so uh, if we end up having to, so what we were envisioning tonight was interestingly, basically using NESDEC's ad from the last time and using their material and getting it on the street as early as tomorrow or at least placing an ad in that could go into education <coughs> week, uh, a week or so, um, and also using you know school spring and using other online resources for ads. And the question is, if we, I don't know how soon we can um, get uh, Nesdec on board or under contract to to take to do this on, and what the planning will be. So I guess I'm I just want people to think through that piece of it, not not exclusive to that, but could we move forward and and or do we just, is everything on hold until NESDEC arrives to, to map this out, what we're going to do? I just, I that's my just, concern. I, I know you called up her, but if I could just, since you raised the issue, yeah. I also 
think that your timeline, what I appreciate the effort that went into crafting it, I think it's completely and totally unreasonable for the exact reason that I said I wanted to use a consultant. There is no time in there for recruiting anyone, and I have to tell you that if, a, if there is someone who's interested in a superintendency and they are trolling the sites every day, they're going to see that ad in time and maybe be able to get their already prepared application in by your deadline. But if you are looking for the exact right person who's not just going for any superintendent job out there, but who really wants to come to Northampton because they feel that they would be a good fit, they see opportunities and challenges here that they'd like to work with, or if you were trying to recruit someone, I don't think that the two weeks <coughs> that you've allowed from the ad going in the paper tomorrow for applications is enough time, number one, and I really don't think that I don't think that our HR department is prepared for what they may get in terms of applications. So I, I can only say that if you want to talk about timeline, that's another reason why I think we should use the consultant. Now I'll be quiet and let Stephanie go. Ms. <laughs> okay. so, so one of my questions was when, when, you, um, when the uh, central office did speak to um, uh, NASDAQ and MASC, did they talk about how, uh, did anybody ask or did they talk at all about how soon they would be able to work with us at all? Do we have any of that information? Yeah. All right, so having been very closely um, tied to the last search and having been the, the chair of the committee for two rounds of that search, I, I have some pretty strong opinions. Um, I do not feel like they bungled at all, yet they made a mistake. And not to say that we wouldn't make a, a similar error. I actually think that they led us through a, a very thoughtful process, a lot of which we do not need to redo. I do not personally think we need to do for, um, um, focus groups and all that kind of thing. I, I think that they really helped us do that very, very well. I would be all in favor of um, working with NESDEC again, especially given I, this, you know, when I asked you to go get this information, this came back better than I expected <laughs> in terms of dollar, dollars. Um, I would be, I would be um, very pleased to work with them again because I was very pleased with their outcome last time and I was um, pleased with how they took us through the process even though we had to go through it, especially maybe because we had to go through it twice. Um, in terms of this timeline, I, I, at first I was going to say it's very ambitious. I actually can't say that because I think it's unrealistic and I think it's unfair. I think two weeks is not nearly enough time to do exactly as Lisa said. And if we work with a company like NASDAQ, um, they, they have access to, um, uh, to um, recruiting Databases. tools that we do not have, and I think it would be a shame not to take advantage of that. Um, you know, last time I, when we were at this meeting, I wasn't even sure that I wanted to be looking for a permanent superintendent right, right away. Um, a, a good part of my um, reluctance had to do with um, the cost of a search, which is somewhat allayed right now. But um, I, I was also very concerned about kind of our whole administrative team being in such flux right now with so many changes and really wanting to know if this was the, the best way to go about it. And, it, you know, if we can get NOSDEC on board with us, and I think that, the, you know, they already know us. I think that, you know, just it wasn't that long ago. Sorry. <laughs> um, that I really think that if we even could work with the same person again, I think that he would have, he has a really good sense of who we are and how we operate and what we need, and I think that we could get on board with them pretty quickly if they are available to work with us that fast. But this fast <coughs> is unrealistic to me. And I also think that if we do this, we have to be prepared that no matter what our timeline is, that if we don't find the right person by the end of the school year, we have to also be thinking about what we would do for an interim. And that's where I would want to look as local as possible. Um, somebody who would be familiar with, with the Northampton needs. Um, but when it comes to actually choosing who's going to be the leader of our, of our district for however many years we have somebody here, I, I don't want to limit it. I would very much like to work with NASDAQ again. Um, and no disrespect to our HR department, but I think that this is going to be an enormous amount of work in a short amount of time, and that's what they do. That's what NASDAQ does. No, Richard, you have your hand up first. So, Mr. Bourne and then Mr. Moore. So okay. Well, this is slightly or slightly <laughs> off. Which <laughs> <laughs> way? It's all Are you? Okay. Go ahead. Go. <laughs> this is slightly off the side. I think um, whichever whichever approach we take towards doing the search, I really would like to hear uh, Laurel Delano Davis's comments. I think we really need to make 
sure that the Civil Rights Committee has some input into whoever it is who is doing the search and the recruiting, because I think that's a really valid point that she raised. I was just going to say, when I saw the schedule, I was pretty concerned about, is this how you find the best superintendent for, for Northampton? And I'm, I'm going to go back to this. I think somebody needs to talk to Gwen Agna and Nancy Athos and, <coughs> and say, would one of them be the, you know, a good person to be the interim superintendent so we can do the, the superintendent search with the time it requires to do it right? So that's my opinion. I'll, I, I, I'll take Ms. Pick first. That's fine. Um, I also wanted to speak to the, um, the makeup of the membership committee, which is not the same as what we had last time. I don't know how, how where this one came from. Um, last time we had um, 11 people on the committee. Um, it included somebody from the college as well as somebody from NEF as well as somebody from the business community, um, along with these other, um, other um, people. We did not have the human resource director on there. And, that's a, that's a curious one to me, no disrespect intended, but um, um, I'm not not sure where that well, would... We were putting it on there in the context that that, that, person. that that person would be there to assist with the search, not you know, to be part of, of that screening committee. Right. To me, that actually feels like a little bit more of a conflict of interest, but um, I, I could be wrong about that. But I, I would like us to um, to think about the makeup of I this committee say, as well. HR rep staff sit on much every screening committee that happens hmm. on the city at, yeah. in terms of helping guide okay, the so process. My only experience is here through school committee, and so we've certainly never had yeah. anything like that before. But we did I, we did have a pretty broad representation across the community um, that um, former mayor and I worked pretty hard on, on putting together. Um, and I think actually having 11 people, we, we purposely chose an odd number in case we had a problem with the vote. Um, and um, 11 people seemed like a good a good number because occasionally there would be somebody who might not be able to come and so we didn't want to ever feel like we had too few people um, meeting candidates or, or representing um, the district on the committee. So I'd, I'd want to look at that as well. Okay. I would second that. From um, being relatively new to the school committee, I understand that there's a learning curve and I've been dealing with the learning curve. That being said, the Human Resources Department dealt forever with the city and is, is more new with dealing with the, um, the demands of the school department. And while I, not saying I distrust by any means your Human Resources Department, I believe, just based on my own experiences, the learning the learning curve, how much I've learned from the day when I came in here to what I know now, and I would just hate to put that job in the hands of, of um, inexperience when we already have for $4,000, $3,960, a company that will probably care again that we went through it two years ago, that they made a mistake, and I think that they'll probably give us um, good service and I'd like to move since I made the motion last time to hit the floor running I'd like to move that we use um, the New England School Development Council um, and pick it up from there so is that a motion that's a motion I'd okay. like to make a motion let's have discussion I will second okay um, uh, and again I, I guess I will have to now I was defending them in absentia, and now I have to defend them in person. I may actually, well, I don't know if the HR director wishes to say anything, but in terms of, I sure. I guess I'm a little bit confused, because I don't see this as an either or thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like we would go to NASDAQ or whomever we choose, and we say, look, this is what we want. This is the resource that we have to help you. This is our timeline. Let's work together to figure it out. So I guess I don't, I, I, am I missing something? And they can help generate candidates. And they can help generate candidates. They can use the HR, HR department to, to whatever level they want. NASDAQ right? worked very closely with our central office staff last time around. And now they, they can work very closely with our HR department. So it was our office that, you know, put together packets and did, all, did, a, lot of, did a lot of the background work. Um, NASDAQ did the first round of screening of the, the, the applications went to NASDAQ. They did the, the first round of screening. Things came to us and packets were put together and looked through and all of that here. Um, they, they, our, our 
district did an enormous amount of work with NOSDUC. And there's no reason why we can't do that again. No, it really moves things, it moves things along. So there's been a, oh, go ahead. Motion made and seconded. Yep. Yeah, I, I just want to say that Stephanie has recent experience with the search. She was the liaison to NASDAQ for the last search, and she's very familiar with what happened. I've been through <coughs> three superintendent searches, one of which I was in her position, the liaison and the vice chair of the school committee at that time, and I can, I can corroborate everything that she's just said about the services that are provided by the consulting firm, the kind of, of uh, legwork that they do to make sure that candidates have submitted all of the right stuff, that they really are qualified, that they're certified or certifiable, which they usually have to be to be t looking for this position, that they, um, and, and if, you know, if a candidate is missing something, they have the prerogative to contact that person and say, gosh, we got your application, you look really good, except you're missing this one thing, do you have that and you forgot to send it, could you get it to us? Um, it's, it, they have the flexibility, I think, not to be as black and white and not to say, no, I'm sorry, you're not being considered because you missed the cutoff date, which was yesterday. I, I just really feel that they also have the opportunity to go out and do some recruiting, to contact people that they know of and say, is there someone that you think would be interested in this position that would be a good fit for it? And it's just, that's just an opportunity that I don't believe that we should miss. I, I agree with you that there are some things that we can probably do in-house and that we did do in-house the last time, but there's so much that they do that, that we shouldn't burden our human resources department with because it would be unnecessary. So, I'm not I, I, think, I think we can find a good mix of the two. Well, I'm I will also tell you that I've heard from a number of the people who were on the committee last time who have already volunteered to be on it again. So that it might be more efficient. That there are people who think that it might be more efficient to, if you can pull together as much of the committee before because we worked well together. Um, good results. We had good results. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mr. Mai. So, um, so. One concern I had was the perception of confidentiality for local candidates. Um, one thing that the NESDAQ consultants impressed upon us was that in that initial screening round when candidates are putting their name out there that they absolutely need that that is a black hole and should they withdraw that that file disappears forever from the face of the earth and part of their insurance if you're a candidate applying from local areas that it's going to NESDEC and those the initial screening was done and the, not all of the applications were passed on to us so the applications that were actually copied and then distributed to the screening committee had already been through a primary screening process in NESDEC's offices and I'm not saying that HR would not be confidential but it's the perception it's the perception that those are going locally rather than to a completely disinterested 30 third party consultant that would have its reputation damaged very badly if, if it was ever perceived that they had, you know, allowed that information to go further. Um, and so, again, it's not something that I don't think that HR has the procedures in place, but if you're someone from the community and there's even a tiny fraction of a chance that a file could be seen by someone, it may, it may tip whether or not you throw your name in for that initial screening. I just, I, I, that's a fair concern, although I would just say that we have this issue that happens with all of our job you know we have people that are applying for high-level positions from other communities and there's that same level of confidentiality until someone becomes a public candidate so um, but but that's a fair obviously a fair point so I'd just like to say I, I by no means would think that they would do that our human resources would do a, a bad job or wouldn't attempt to do the best job that they could I just like what what we got out of the last I like mr. Salza um, I like the, I, I mean, it, it netted a positive result. And for the amount of money that we're looking at, less than $4,000, we already have, I mean, for everything that everyone else has said, but we can recruit different. They, they have, they're in that environment, the educational environment, where they can recruit better, I believe. Okay. So, so but nothing bad at all. I want to put that on the record okay. about our human. Re I do not know of them. I do not know anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so, think they're very nice. <laughs> so, uh, they probably are. They were nice when I went in. <laughs> um, uh, they 
are very nice people. They may not be um, never a problem. Pleased with my dragging them out on a thir late Thursday night um, for this, but um, I will. Um, so there's been a motion made and seconded to the that the, the school committee wishes to um, uh, proceed with using Nesdeck as uh, engaging, re-engaging Nesdeck to do a search uh, under the existing contract, the terms of the existing contract. For me, with the caveat that they can get on board very quickly to start mm -hmm. working with us. I mean, if they tell us that they're not available to, I mean, because they're so busy right now that they can't start doing anything with us for months, then I would look to MS MASC to fulfill part of our um, contract with them. But, I mean, I, yes, I would love to work with NOSDUC again. Okay. So it's assuming that they can be available in the short term to work with us. I don't know how to put that into a motion. When is the short term? Yeah, we so try to put that into a motion. Immediate, almost immediately. Yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I, but obviously, keep in mind your, the, the search we've described here is I mean, trying to be a transition for when the I Superintendent Salzer leaves. So I don't know that any, I don't think that there's that. There, I think we're, it's fine as long as we keep in mind. I don't think that they're going to be able to create anything. That's going to still get us to that transition point. So that's good. That's fine. Well, we can report back to you mm -hmm. on what we hear on their ability to get reengaged mm -hmm. um, and what that time is. And if it's a, a concerning amount of time, we can ask the committee to come back together for further discussion on that. Mm -hmm. So, so there's been a motion made and seconded um, to move forward with the NESDEC search uh, to engage NESDEC. Is there any further discussion on that motion? I just have a clarifying question. So we, we vote on this motion, and then tomorrow you're going to call NESDEC, and then they're going to say it's three weeks from now before they can start. So what, what happens after that? Do we, are we, I guess what happens at that point? Are we locked in a NESDEC, or are what we I'm saying that? I guess what I'm, uh, what I'm taking, well, the, what, I take, what I take away from the motion is that you want uh, the sort of the more, in-house search to stop and to have NESDEC wait for NESDEC to come and, and that was what I take away from the, from what's being considered right now. And obviously they would be involved in coming up with a schedule of and coming up with a de deadline for applications and they would be developing, the t they would basically be developing a timeline. So we would be waiting for them to do that. But they would understand though that we are under a timeline too, so I'm sure that, I mean, if they couldn't, they would tell us right up front. And the, um, the um, school committee, the Massachusetts Association of School Committee, the expenses are 35, which includes electronic advertising. Well, the advertising, I think, is a key point because it's part of the recruiting. I mean, they would, they're, they're within, the, they know other schools, they, the community, educational community. So, are you comfortable with how I've described that? I mean, what in terms of if we Absolutely. ask them and then they're going to give us an answer and we'll report back to people on the timeline? I mean, are, are, and it sounds like you want to communicate that we want this ASAP. My, my expectation is that they're going to be able to work with us quickly, mm -hmm. or I think they would. Hopefully, okay. they would have said that when we when we called them. I don't know if any, anything about time was talked about, except that they know that okay. our superintendent's leaving. I think that we're approaching all of this with an air of optimism, and I think that that's good. And I think that it needs to be understood that it's, I mean, hopefully everything will fall into place, and it's just optimistic. And if not, then we have the interim, and we go that direction. I mean, hopefully it will all work out. And that's, I think we should just assume the best. Mayor? To quote Mrs. Riddle's little pin. <laughs> the, the other point is, if the school committee um, um, approves this ad for us to use and, and NESDEC can start working with us, then they can take this ad and change the bottom here for contact information and they can start working, um, they can put this out even before they come and meet with us. Definitely. Mm -hmm. so. It's the same ad they used last time, so it's... Is it exactly it, the same? I, except we've just changed the bottom to yep. modify it, that's, and so... Any other um, any other comments or questions on the motion? Okay. Um, so then, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All those abstaining. Okay. Um, so the motion clearly carries. Mm -hmm. So uh, so then we will report back to you on what we hear from uh, from Nesdec in terms of their time. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
speaking of time, I'd just like to really thank the Human Resource Department for coming tonight. And um, it, once again, nothing negative, but thank you very much for coming. Would, thank you both. Would it be appropriate for us, last year, last, not last year, two years ago, <laughs> two years ago, we had a, there was a, a small committee, it was like two, one or two people who was who NESDEC spoke to and dealt with. Uh, should we right now go ahead and form that small committee so that should NESDEC <laughs> say yes, we can take this up now, we have someone for them to call now? It, it wasn't a small committee, it was me. It was just you, all by yourself? Committee of one. You, okay. You and I and Downey did the work on the ad and the brochure. No, it wasn't me, it was uh, Alden. Alden? Yeah. Maybe it was Alden, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was most Not me at all, I was not down yet. <laughs> I was actually, um, did the work on the brochure and the ad and, and stuff, which I think are still now relevant. They seem pretty relevant. Um, still good. So but do we want to do that? Just have a I think it's have a well, person to be who Stephanie has, was? I, I think Stephanie I think really at the time was the vice chair and she the vice chair. I think that's why she step okay. mispicked it. It was because she was the vice chair. I'm she was the vice chair. Since he's the vice chair. You're right. She was the vice chair, but she also chose to take that role as the liaison to the to the uh, search consultant. Mm -hmm. There is no um, Requirement right. that the vice chair do that, and I think it should, which should be up to the vice chair as to whether he has an interest and whether his schedule allows for it. And if not, then you can select the board, mm -hmm. the school committee could select another representative to serve as the liaison to the search committee. I mean, to the search consultant. Well, I think it's my responsibility to. that they can get back to us and work with us in a timely manner. And I would wait to hear from the mayor after he contacts them. And uh, I will begin to speak with them. Is that the same as saying that you're willing to be, that you're going to be on the committee? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're gonna be able to do that with, with your yes. friend Susan? I think, I, I, think I, in my current role and mm -hmm. where I sit, I think it's, Part of my responsibility to oversee it. I agree. And with the change of the charter. Yes, what you're hearing from her is simply an acknowledgement of how time consuming it is. Mm -hmm. And she, she's just trying to protect you. I, and if you so feel that you I, can handle it, I think that's But I also understand assistance. that I don't think that you're in a position to be able to do it either right now. Or are you? Actually, what I was going to offer is for you to consider whether or not you had the time, given what your what your spring usually looks like, to say that I would be willing to do that again if you feel unable to do so. But you consider it as the vice chair. I want to give you that prerogative. How about if we could work on it together? I think that's a great idea. I need some music now. I have a no, feeling. That's a great we're, idea. We're sort of straying from regular order now. <laughs> So I think we may want to get back onto the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Surely have this discussion. You get to name the committee, so. Okay. Do you, do you want some direction from the group about the committee? That's how we get it last time. I will, I will be fully deferring to the committee on this. <clears throat> yep. I will be deferring fully to the committee. So that's oh, totally is. fine. Yeah. So, <coughs> and I think we have, we're not at the point where we can really be discussing that. So, um, so the next item on the agenda is moving back up to the business manager's report. Um, do we have a, we do have a business manager's report? Mm -hmm. I'll make this quick since we've discussed many of the items on the business manager report already through the budget and other areas. I do have one change in the business manager report. Under contracts, I had Dell software <laughs> licensing. Um, that contract is still in the works, uh, not in the picture. I should be replacing that uh, with the X2 Development Corporation, which is the new student data information system that was previously read by the mayor under the consent agenda. Um, other than that, the uh, financials are also attached that were sent out to you via email as to where we are in our current spending right now. So um, I'll keep my report brief. Okay, the next item is the uh, personnel report. Personnel report is, is the one page with uh, uh, one new hire, uh, a 
couple of substitutes, separations. There are four staff members with uh, also two substitute <laughs> staff members uh, separating. No retirements and one promotion. Okay, the next item is the superintendent's report. Over to me. Today's highlights are about our goal in meeting the needs of students who are either at risk of dropping out of school or at risk of falling behind the grade level and also uh, students who are English language learners. So around the district at Bridge Street, Bridge Street School has hired a new special education teacher to work uh, with behavioral intervention uh, to help support students at risk. This teacher works with students who have significant emotional and behavioral challenges and the goal is to help these students overcome their challenges by providing them with constant teacher support, positive reinforcements, a tailored curriculum, and a setting that makes them feel safe and free to express their feelings. At Ryan Road, outreach to all of our families has had particular attention uh, over many years through the Civil Rights Committee uh, and their school council and the approach they use by staff with the families. This outreach has led Ryan Road to create events like Hispanic Heritage Fiesta in October and the Cambodian New Year, which we are celebrating today, April 11th. Our families have helped us plan these events that help everyone feel connected to the school. Uh, these events have regularly been attended by 150 to 200 people each time, and they are particularly welcoming to the English language learning families since we celebrate, celebrate their traditions, language, and culture. Over at Leeds School, they have been offering AM tutoring three times per week in math and reading that is well attended by students of Hispanic heritage. And next year, they are looking to arrange a bus to recruit more kids uh, so that they'll be able to arrive early uh, for tutoring before school. Leeds also has a lunch bunch designed for students at risk of failure. They meet daily with selected students from their classrooms, and it's facilitated facilitated by two ESPs um, to help the children socialize with and, and learn from students who are excelling in school. Over at JFK, the grade eight English language learning students were given an opportunity to practice their science presentations about molecules and the carbon cycle with their ELL teacher. The teacher worked with the students and gave them feedback also, other adults and students listen to their practice presentations and help them with pronunciation and clarity before they actually got in front of the class. The sixth grade English language learners have been practicing asking for and giving directions while working on reading small maps. This activity is in preparation for their team field trip to the Bronx Zoo. <laughs> and at the high school, to help students perform well, not only on the access for the ELL test, but also in their three other content area classes, they practice daily conversation skills by discussing local and world news events. Uh, they read a variety of informational texts that explore areas such as medicine and health, the arts, science, ancient civilizations, explorers, and geography. Students read orally in front of the class, which helps develop the students' abilities to make presentations in other classes, improves their diction, pronunciation, and confidence. Finally, students sharpen their listening skills by writing a daily dictation. So the teacher will uh, say a, a sentence out loud, one sentence at a time. They hear this and they write it down for accuracy in spelling and grammar. Students write the dictations in both English and their native language, and this is important for maintaining their first language skills while they acquire English. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the, um, is there any new business to be discussed? Okay. I did, I, I just wanted to bring up that um, we are members of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, and Mr. Bourne um, brought up the Legislative Advocacy Day, and I'd like to say that that's in place of um, the Day on the Hill that was scheduled for April 30th. And I just wanted to, I brought in to um, read that members are urged to make appointments with their legislators for May 21st and follow through with discussions on the future of education, funding, and the need to support and strengthen services, um, and, and different things that we have, but I also, um, the House of Representatives has a transportation bill of $500 million right now, and, the, and Governor Patrick has a budget of $1.5 billion. And um, I, well, and the Republicans say, so 
something else altogether, the Senate. But I think that we really need to go. I, I would be interested in also going and um, representing our school's needs because I do think that we need to get out and take legislative action. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. May 21st, 8.30 a.m. is where it is. Okay. Oh, Ms. Minnick. You went to new business, and I just wanted you not to forget that we had moved the rules of procedure. Oh, oh darn. yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, darn, yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. You were just helping. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> I, have, I deeply apologize. Um, so we will move back up in the agenda to the um, uh, vote on post-charter amendments to school committee rules of procedure. So I will turn the floor over to the chair of the Rules and Policy Committee uh, to discuss those uh, proposed rules changes. Right. This afternoon you should have received a, a revised or a draft copy of the revised Rules of Procedure. Um, and even at that, there are a couple of places where I need to draw your attention to things. And there are a couple of places also where there may be some discussion. So if I could go through. I think there were conservatively a hundred changes made to this document. In most cases that was capitalization or changing the word board to school committee or spelling out a number or you know making some grammatical or syntactical change. Um, and there were some substantive changes in here as well, but even though some of them were they 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 weren't inconsequential, <laughs> but I think they were something that would be considered acceptable because they were outlining what our current process is or um, bringing the language up to the current standards or reflecting the law. So with that said, I would like to go through and tell you where some of the big changes are that are noteworthy. Um, and bear with me. So section 1.1, the first section of is completely different than it was in the previous version of this document. The 1.1 is lifted directly from the charter. So that entire section is some is new, but it's lifted the language is lifted directly from the charter. 1.2 the it, it mentioned in organizational meeting, we have now stated that the first meeting following an inauguration will be in an organizational meeting. Previously, we had an organizational meeting annually. Now we're speaking to have this every other year, which means that the three things that are listed under there will happen only every other year. So once per term, if you will. Uh, 1.3, however, leaves the says within a week following the first meeting of each calendar year, which previously said um, mm -hmm organizational meeting. Now we've specified that each year, however, we will appoint subcommittees. So that's the first area that I want you to consider for discussion. We have said that a vice chair's term will be two years, that the executive secretary will be for two years, rules procedure are for two years, but subcommittees are only a one-year thing. So please understand that difference from what was our previous version. 1.4 went back and forth. It currently says that the vice chair will act as the official spokesperson for the committee. Under section two, the second thing I really want you to think about is the standing subcommittees, including the first one listed there, a subcommittee of, for curriculum. Um, I guess a year or more ago, maybe two years ago, more or more ago, this body decided that curriculum issues were of such importance to it that it wanted to hear them as a group, as a committee of the whole. And so the curriculum committee has met only rarely since that time. I want you to consider whether you want to continue having, stand, having the curriculum committee as a standing subcommittee or whether you want to revise that. Understand, please, that if you do, 2.2 will then change because it says that each committee will be appointed to one of the first three subcommittees, which means that all nine members are serving on a subcommittee. If you change 
having a curriculum committee, we will either need to change who serves on committees or what. Pardon? Well, they could be on conference committee or not. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, we need to, to consider that. So that's the second thing I want you to think about. But you can see that it currently states that the curriculum committee still exists and the appointment process is the same as it was. Um, the next important thing for you to consider is um, 3.4. The conference committee and it says in here actually to meet with the city council for the purpose of communication we revised that but somewhere along the way the language got lost um, so it wasn't included and I'd like to at some point in time I'm perhaps will ask for a motion to amend this thing with the language that we would have included had we been on top of everything so section four uh, has a, a sentence at the end of it that says the chair shall notify the school committee of the membership of any such ad hoc and that should say committees <laughs> ad hoc committees so, um, <coughs> section six the very first section of that in the old version of the rules of procedure has been deleted it dealt with vacancies in the term for ward representatives who had four-year terms to the extent that we no longer will have four-year terms under the charter that entire section was deleted and the and filling of vacancies for two-year term the language that was in place for the at-large representatives is now the language that we're suggesting for all representatives because they all have two-year terms you can read through all the rest of the stuff if you want to however the next significant change comes my recollection was that we discussed this it's not changed in here as of right now but I want to ask the other members of the rules and policy committee 10.4 talks about minutes and it says the draft minutes shall be available one week after the regular meeting and I believe that our discussion was that that the open meeting law requires that draft minutes be available within 10 days after the meeting we were gonna look into it. and we were going to look into it and find out if that's true if it is 10 days I'm not sure why we hold ourselves to a higher uh, page 4 of 7 10.4 10 says draft minutes shall be available one week after the regular meeting I believe the open meeting law says minutes must be available 10 days after no they're 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 available on So if they're, if I went and read that stupid law. Yeah. <laughs> Can we? Because I originally, my original recommendation was that we change it to 48 hours because I thought that's what it was. And then when I went back and read it, it said 10 days. And I want to be sure that we're not confusing it with executive session minutes. Yeah. Um, and generally, the rule is like if someone wants the draft, like if they want a yellow legal pad with the handwritten notes, they're entitled to that. Um, well, you know, could so you could you give me your best guess on what our rule, <laughs> what it should say here? It previously it said I'll, I'll one week. Okay, guess. okay, we'll keep going. Um, section twelve previously said a quorum shall consist of five elected school committee members. Based on the description in section one point one of what the school committee is in the charter. We have changed that. It now says a quorum shall consist of six school committee members. Okay, so that is a change. Um, no other really big things until you get to 15.6, which is, um, I can't remember if that's actually a new thing or if it's just a revision to a previous one but it refers to the open meeting law and posting requirements so that's there there is new language in that article if it's not a whole new thing section 16 is brand new and it does just reflect that we will follow the open meeting law 
section 20 should be titled executive session, not executive session minutes. It should just read executive session. And it should say the school committee may hold executive session in accordance with the open meeting law and create and maintain accurate minutes of it. The mayor proposed a much longer section 20, but we felt that just saying that we were following open meeting law rather than repeating the entire law in the rules made sense. So, and those are the major changes. So, again, do you want a curriculum subcommittee and are you okay with um, the one year and two year distinctions for some term things? So, um, Comments about that, or um. Mr. Bourne. Sorry, I, <laughs> Mr. Bourne earlier, so I had to be confused. Go ahead. I know I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you is the ventriloquist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wondered on the executive session if we want to have in our rules some sort of a process for. Um, regular review for public release well, so they don't just sit around forever? Well, that's actually what I proposed. Um, that was what I proposed. Uh, it wasn't a recitation of the open meeting law. It was actually a procedure for how you um, would review and release the minutes. I was just saying, because um, otherwise there's a real possibility to sort of get moldy over there and people forget about them and, yeah. and there's been no... What I had proposed was actually something the council adopted, which was a procedure whereby the chair of this body or the council president is required every quarter to review them to make sure that the reason for the executive session has not gone away and if not bring them forward and um and release them so that's what i proposed um that's uh, what i was asking about so, something like that to keep to make sure it doesn't just get left on the back burner all right so then that would say that the rules and policy subcommittee members made an assumption that got us in trouble. <laughs> it, sec, your, your recommendation for 20.2 did seem to be something that's included in the open meeting law, and we thought, you know, if we were, do you need a copy of that? No, I, no, I, I, I recall okay. it. Mostly. Okay. So that one just said, um, according to the provisions of the open meeting law and it lists the law there. Then it does list in 20.3 and 20.4 the a process, but again, we thought that was probably covered with we the didn't law. We take issue with the content of what you said. Mm -hmm. We just didn't know that it was necessary to include all of the details since it's covered by the law. And it was quite lengthy. Yeah, you're right. Um, and uh, uh, it's a good, I'm, I'm not quite prepared. Uh, to go through it, I mean, it's fine. I mean, if you want, we can. Um, I, mean, I mean, I can certainly make that. I guess I'll, I can certainly just do that without it being in the rules. I suppose. Um, I don't know that the open meeting law goes down to that level of specificity of what the procedures for each body that does with their executive session rules. So that's why we created something like that on the city council side. So I was proposing the same thing on the school committee side. Um, so. I don't think we took any issue with the content, so it can be included. I yeah. Mean, we, I, I have no trouble uh, supporting that. I don't know. I don't, I obviously don't but you have don't have the, the language in front of you, so of me, but I, I can don't add next remember week. it saying what the procedure would be for releasing them. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I don't think a reference to the, it just says, you know, you do have to eventually release them, but it doesn't say what, what your process is going to be. And that's all I was saying is if, if we, we should, I think we should make it be a rule as opposed to just relying on the goodwill or, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, you know, we could, we could go ahead with, um, with the proposal and we could um, make copies of this for next meeting and, and amend the, just with this, this section next meeting, if that made sense. That's fine. Whatever, whatever. I just, I want, that's fine. We could circulate yeah. that. I'm not, well, I'm okay with it. It's, Yes. I just had a question about three, um, three subcommittees kind of thinking larger than curriculum. I mean, where did these three subcommittees come from? I mean, is this kind of best practices around the state, around the country, or is this something that was invented 
in Northampton 20 years ago, and so we're, I mean. No, it was, it was in the rules of procedure way long before 20 years ago. <laughs> right, but. It's, it's been there since I got here. Right. So I'm I saying, don't is know. Is that the best way to, I mean, are those the best subcommittees for us to have, or should we have other yeah. ones? Should we have different ones? Do we need that many? I mean, have we thought about that? I'm just asking, is that just in terms of like best practices, is that the way to, do we want to do it? I mean, if it is, that's fine, but I'm just asking the question. Um, may I answer? Years ago, when we when we did discuss this, um, was when we decided that we would maintain the committee's um, the rules and policy to deal with the nitty gritty of of this because it, it's so time consuming that to take up time in the full committee just didn't make sense. Um, budget and property. At, at first, we thought, no, we want everybody there, and we weren't going to do it. But then we realized that it was really very valuable, especially for the business manager, to kind of vet the. Um, budget um, situation first because the budget committee asks a lot of questions and helps them prepare for the full meeting. So we kept up with that. But as a group, we decided that, that curriculum, um, it's just generally big topics that come up that are of interest to everybody and was, was worth hearing here. And since then, I don't think curriculum has actually met. Um, I, so I, I think that the curriculum subcommittee should come out. I don't see a purpose for it. And, and the chair can always name right. um, uh, a temporary committee uh, to look at a particular issue if that were deemed necessary. So um, I just had one quick, uh, well, there is, the, the open meeting law does say uh, that the chair shall at reasonable interview intervals review the minutes of executive sessions to determine if they warrant non-disclosure. So, what I was proposing was trying to put some parameters around it in the rules. So, uh, you know, if as a compromise, we wanted to just add that language to that executive session, just that sentence even, and I can, you know, I can do it at my own intervals without having to put it in the rules, but even just adding that, sec that sentence that says, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the public body or its chair shall at reasonable interview intervals review the minutes of executive sessions to determine if if the provisions of this subsection warrant continued non-disclosure. So, and, then it, and it says such determination shall be announced at the body's next meeting, um, and the announcement shall be included in the minutes meeting. I mean, that doesn't have, but I mean, just acknowledging that at regular intervals we'll be reviewing them and releasing them. I think just having that in there, I'm fine with that. It doesn't have to be the lengthy sentences. I would like to put some sort of outside parameter on what reasonable interval is. So whether it's at least annually or... Well, I was proposing quarterly. I, was I know, but that's what I'm saying, because otherwise, every you know, somebody's, years. you know, yeah. Yeah. every 20 years. Yeah. I mean, if push comes to shove, the law says that once the reason goes away, right. they should have been, they should be released. So it's in our interest to not right. make it a long interval. Right. So. so that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. I just put in a little comment there, at least at quarterly or at least every six months or something yeah. so as to give an idea of what we think reasonable is. Okay. I think maybe the best way for this to go at this moment is for me to make a motion to approve the rules of procedure revised as presented this evening. But I had some more comments too, so mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I was just gonna move that we have these and then we can talk about what amendments might be made to them so, so I mean, you could go ahead and make, or someone could make a motion <coughs> to include that as an amendment to the thing this evening okay. before we vote it, okay. is what I'm getting at. Okay. So I'm making a motion that you approve the thing. I'll second. Okay, good. Okay, now then. So if you want to make, you can't. I don't really want to make yeah, the motion. I, I guess I would uh, just. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd like to make that amendment. I could, that, give, uh, I could give the vice chair the language and he could um, <laughs> read it. Will it be to add another section, 20.2? Mm -hmm. It could just be added to the executive session section, probably. Um, it could be 20.2. Quarterly, every three months, we 
review the minutes of executive sessions to determine if the provisions of this subsection warrant continued non-disclosure. But I think it would be, we'd have to modify that slightly just because it's referring to the subsection of that law, but if the... Um, so that would be section 20.2 in our rules. In our rules. Yes. Okay, is that a motion? It's an amendment. So, oh, so, so if will you second it? I will second it. Okay. Great. <laughs> so is there any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we're back to the main motion. <laughs> I've got Knock yourself out. Um, <laughs> section 1.3. Northampton Community TV, it's uh, actually that's a, it's a board seat that this committee appoints that board seat on the NCTV board. So it's not a liaison, it's a representative, representative, to, the actual representative to the board of. Um, so I'd like to amend section 1.3 to say that. Second. So there's been a motion made and seconded to change, I'm assuming you're saying a ch uh, change liaison to a representative. Representative to the board of, a b or a board member of. No, I like a, a representative to the board of the Northampton Community TV, to the board. We were actually appointing, yeah, we, we were actually appointing a, a board member. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to make that change. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, we, we also have a board member of the NEF that we appoint. It was, I think it was Mike Flynn before it was me. It's actually an appointment to the board of the NEF. So the same thing. It'll be that's not like any other such positions as may be approved by the it's actually right, that's what we were yeah. trying to do well, it's actually a non-voting uh, well it's no, more no, of a, the, the mayor er, 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 yeah, no. the superintendent's ex officio but the um, for us we the NEF actually elects us onto it it's just we we recommend it but it's actually it's never really been an official yeah. this board see okay it's not been a, it's not an official one it's just something that is a great for us to have the presence but it's not a requirement or anything. It's it's more of a recommendation. It's not there. Oh, sorry, in they, don't, they don't have special anyway. seats for anybody, do they? No. Right. right. So we have no authority to appoint anyone to the board. They do try to recruit somebody. It's true. Right. That's why we say if any other such positions yeah. okay. as approved. Okay. So I'll withdraw that amendment. Okay. I just did also wanted to correct. So in my reading here, so the ten day rule does actually mm -hmm. apply because they're treating it as a public records request. So if someone requests any public document, you. <laughs> you have 10 days to respond. So that's what the- From the date that they requested, according to the, but see I had asked, and I right. talked about that for Massachusetts Association of School Committees, from the date that it's requested, you have 10 days to respond. That's correct. Right. It so says- That's the set. It says, minutes of all open <laughs> sessions shall be created and approved in a timely manner. The minutes of an open session, if they exist, and whether approved or in draft form, shall be made available upon request by any person within 10 days. That's right. Which is, yes, the, 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 I mean, you can provide them faster, but the 10 days is the benchmark that you have to respond to somebody to a public records request. So that is why I wondered, ours say, the draft minutes shall be available one week after the regular meeting. I would like that to say, the draft minutes shall be made available 10 days after the regular meeting, because that's the earliest, even if somebody requests them immediately after the meeting, that would be the earliest that we would be required. That's 10.4. That would be the <coughs> earliest that we would be required to have them out. So I don't want to commit us to something that's any more stringent than the law requires of us, just in case it's vacation week or somebody gets sick. So let, can we give ourselves as much time as possible? Well, in giving ourselves as much time as possible, it actually states that from when it's requested. So if we put it in that way, even though we have the 10 days, let's say we're really busy, vacation, et cetera, and she hasn't had any requests and it's on her thing, she has a request, she then has 10 days to respond to that person. Um, I, I think that we're still limiting ourselves by saying 10 days after the minute. I do think after the request, just as it's stated that it should be. Okay. So, so 
I'm not the chair, but did you want to make a motion? Oh, thanks. I'd like to make a motion that it, it state that. Um, <coughs> That 10.4 read the draft. Okay, thank you. She'll be available. Right, thank you. 10.4 should be available within, within 10 days. Within uh, 10 after days the after request. any request. Right, after requested. And actually, it shall, it has to be. That's the law. Yeah. It's not shall. I mean, it, it has to be. Mr. Meyer, just, uh, I'll second it for uh, purpose of discussion, but I don't think that's the law actually says that minutes shall be created and approved in a timely manner. Right. So to key it on a request would not to be complying with the law. I think that you could say, if you want to give us the broadest latitude, you would say that minutes, draft minutes shall be created and approved in a timely manner. But they do have to be, I asked about this, and I've, I've said that ever since when I first went to the chartering the course with, when, they, when I first came on, that was one of the questions that I asked specifically was that, and it isn't, it's within 10 days, and I believe you don't even have to give it to them within 10 days, you just have to respond to them within 10 days and then tell them when you will give it to them. Well, I mean, so it even goes I further. Think, I don't think that's accurate. It's that if you, if you wait six months to create minutes and then someone asks for them and you say, or our practices is then to provide them 10 days from that date. I think that the Attorney General would say doing minutes six months after the meeting does not comply with create and approve in a timely manner. So I, I agree, I mean, the minutes have to be there if they're there, and it says actually if they exist, then you must provide them in 10 days. But I, I don't think we can finesse our way around the fact we need to create the minutes as soon as possible after a meeting. I mean, that's the, I think that's what. So we can say in a timely manner. Yeah. But that's but I mean, is this for us? Because if it's for people to read and, and understand, then they would understand that by reading it that when they requested it, they have 10 days to get it, whether the timely manner has happened for us yet the, or not. The, the request is a secondary part of the law. Right. The first requirement is that we create the minutes in a timely manner. The the provision of them after a request is a second part of the law that you know, we might want to have that we will provide them to the public, but that's a second, that's a second requirement. So you might want to withdraw your motion. All right, I'll withdraw the motion. And somebody else could possibly make a motion that says that we will, the minutes will be available in a timely manner. But I, wait a second, I don't withdraw my motion. <laughs> I take that withdrawal <laughs> back. It, we send this piece back. Now. Okay, and that's fine, we can move it to the next meeting. But I mean, I remember that that's what it says, and I think that people should know that they have 10 days till afterwards and I think that as, our, as us doing our job right we should already be doing everything in a timely manner so I mean if you want to include that also but I do think that it should state in there that it's 10 days after it's being requested even if it's a, a 10.3 or whatever number four or whatever number we're on but um, I do think that that people should know that they have 10 days could, could I so offer could I offer this this amendment if, if our concern is that we comply with open records or open meetings law that the words to do that are right here in the law and that why don't we just, if we want to bring our attention to the fact that there is a law for which we will be penalized if we don't comply with it, we could say the draft minutes shall be created and approved in a timely manner. The minutes of an open session, if they exist and whether approved or in draft form, shall be made available upon request by any person within 10 days. Sure, so moved. It seems like it, and that's my, that's Does my, it say made available upon request? It, it does. So that's, that puts in our, again, I don't, why reinvent something with our own words if it's already down in the statute? So my amendment to your, to your motion would be to Just revise, revise the language to, to include both requirements. I agree, thank you. Okay, so it sounds like Ms. Duvall has withdrawn, but has now seconded Mr. Meyer. Actually, or, she I, didn't, my, I, offer, I didn't I offer, 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 he, he had offered a friendly amendment. You accepted the friendly <laughs> I accept the friendly amendment. Is there a second to the friendly amended motion of Ms. Sure. Duvall. Yes. Okay. Um, which we probably should have had before we even began discussing it. Um, so the question then is, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It was a friendly amendment. All she has okay. is accepted, yeah, and you were the second. Are there any other <laughs> amendments? I would um, amend, there's a, a section missing um, in um, 3.4, the definition of the conference committee. And we abbreviated um, it to be, um, the conference committee is uh, to provide a forum for the discussion of citywide issues that directly or indirectly fall under the jurisdiction of the school committee. And that's taken I'll right second by, that. by laws of the conference committee. So there's been a motion made and seconded. 
That was the that was the discussion of the rules and policy subcommittee. We agreed that that wasn't uh, the right <coughs> definition or description of that subcommittee. We just neglected to get it into this printed copy for you. So that was already debated. If that means anything. Did you make that as a motion? She yes. did. I'll second it. Oh, it's been seconded. Okay. <laughs> I'll call the question. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? I'm abstaining because I didn't actually hear what she said. I'm just checking You're it against the, the I'm reading, but I'm reading to from, again. a forum for the discussion of citywide issues that directly okay, or thank indirectly you. fall under the jurisdiction yes. of the school committee. Okay, it's half of the yes. charter, yes. but it's good yes. with me. It is. Good it is. Okay. It is. Um, so, could I, so can I just ask if, so are you proposing that this get voted on final tonight? Or, okay. First draft. At first reading. No, no, it's not a policy. It is our rules of okay. procedure, mm -hmm. and I moved that it be voted on tonight because I am darn I just tired wanted of to ask, I just had a couple of questions, policy. if I could. Um, yes. And the, and the question is about the, um, the vice chair as the official spokesman. Does that mean that all other members, including the chair, presumably, is not allowed to speak to the press if asked to speak to the press about the school committee or does not mean that at all. Okay. It means that if asked for the sense of the committee or description about a committee's position or action, the vice chair is the person who states that. And it does by default probably mean that the vice chair is the person that will be contacted first to look for a statement regarding the committee. However, it's been my experience, and yours as well, I'm sure, that as the chair you'll be contacted for your own opinion and that individual school committee members may be contacted and can give their own opinions on any issue before the committee. They just cannot speak for the full committee. I just don't understand how, I guess what I don't understand is how one person can speak for a, a ten-member body or can provide sort of the consensus of being authorized. I, I think we authorize it's like so like if we all came to some consensus we would then authorize Ed to then speak on our behalf as okay. um, but it's not like he can't just on his own go on the radio and just <laughs> say, this is what we feel without our without consent. Yeah. Without okay. Uh, you know you know, I apologize. You know my feelings about you, this but you that's and I had just a long debate about yes, this. Yes we did. I thought it was chair and then I was told that you had changed your position on it and that vice chair was correct and well, I, I think I had chair and back. vice chair will act as the spokes oh. people so I, I I'm sorry I was it's misinformed fine. I was I, I can just tell you that I'm sure I, if I tell Barbara solo that I'm sorry I can't talk to you I'm not the official spokesperson I don't think that's going to work no, on her when she tries I think to she will be contacting you so. for your position as the mayor okay. to speak to something if they, if she says wants to know, why did the school committee, you know, vote to approve that stupid budget? She's going to contact Ed, and he's going to say because we went through this discussion and we believed that this was the right thing, and that was, you know, it was a majority vote. Okay. Yes, Mr. Moore. In light of the recent practice in terms of not really using the curriculum subcommittee and the fact that so much of our curriculum is now dictated by the state and the federal governments, um, I'm going to move that we um, eliminate the curriculum subcommittee. So there's been a motion made and seconded to eliminate the curriculum subcommittee. Any discussion on that? Do the members of the curriculum subcommittee wish to respond? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think one of the, the things, the curriculum subcommittee served a really good purpose for a while when we looked at assessment and data. Um, and what happened was we would come and report and everyone's like, well, why can't we see that data? So the, when we made the decision to bring things forward to the whole group for their benefit, there was a real reason for that. Uh, it's just never made it to the full board agenda we never so a lot of the things that we got to enjoy on the curriculum subcommittee uh, we've never it, when we made this decision to go to the whole board all of that's just disappeared so we're none of us are talking about that we're not looking at data like we used to uh, we're not 
getting updates on implementation of curriculum. I mean, there is an issue here with that, whether we need to have the curriculum subcommittee so these discussions start happening again and that we bring in people from the school to then share this. Um, it, it, I think it's an important decision or discussions to have, but we should be having these in the full board if we truly value that, and I truly value that information. Um, so I guess I'd throw that out there, that if we are going to dissolve the curriculum subcommittees, that perhaps we can make some efforts to bring in the curriculum issues to the full board, um, particularly now that we're nearing the end of budget season and that um, we head into the summer when things, I mean, we're going to be more superintendents, which I understand that. But they, if we stop talking about curriculum and data and assessment, I worry that we're going to lose sight of why we actually do the work that we do, which is all of that. So um, part of me thinks that maybe this is also a call to resurrect the curriculum subcommittee and make it active uh, if the board feels that um, we can't feasibly handle this stuff in the whole group. Um, as, a, as another member of the currently dormant curriculum subcommittee, I would agree with Mike that one of the problems is that we often ask our teachers and administrators to come to the curriculum subcommittee, or we did, and present us with what they're working on and the data they've collected and how they are realigning their teaching or their, inst their instruction in their curriculum to better serve the students in the district. We would do that at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And when those teachers walked in at the end of a school day, they would know that they would make the report to us and they would be out of there in an hour, an hour and a half, which is reasonable. When we bring someone to a full committee meeting and they don't know when they're going to go on in a three and a half hour agenda and the meeting starts at 7.15, I think that's a significantly greater sacrifice. And so I think having this curriculum subcommittee active would allow us to keep asking, you know, keep asking questions, keep making inquiries, and have the teachers and the administrative leadership team bring things back to us. And if we felt something was important, then we could ask to have a place on the agenda. But I do think it's a loss not to have it meeting. Because again, just as we said, you know, budget and property is useful because it allows the business manager to bring things before, you know, to bring a wide selection of things before budget and property, and some of those may be selected to move on to the full committee. I think the same thing is true. I mean, if we have something that is, is uh, a report on something that's an update and we feel like the committee is, is already well informed, we don't have to bring that forward. But if we have some new critical new initiative, then I think our responses may help inform the presentation that's br brought to the full committee. So for that reason, I would, I would vote against this. Ms. Mayor. I think I was only on the curriculum subcommittee for two years in <laughs> my tenure here. but. I, I would take the position that um, all subcommittee meetings are open meetings. Any member of the school committee can attend any of the subcommittee meetings, as well as members of the public are available to attend, are, op are invited to attend subcommittee meetings. And I absolutely agree with Downey's assessment of why they're important and how they could benefit both the presenters and those hearing the presentation. So I would actually argue in favor of keeping the curriculum subcommittee intact. Okay. Just really briefly, I would agree with, with Mike and Lisa and Downey and um, think that it's important to actually have them meet and um, as opposed to when's the last time they met and reactivate the committee because I went over to Bridge Street School Council today and I was fascinated by the curriculum work that they were discussing and I was actually thinking just today that it would be nice to have a curriculum committee where some of the questions could be answered or at least looked at and I just and and as Ms. Minnick said we can go as other board members we can go to the curriculum committee you know if, if we want to go and sit in on it also. Okay any other comments on the amendment? Uh, Mr. I was, I was just gonna say I think the key thing is making sure that that you were talking about how maybe the most interesting stuff could be presented to the full committee, making sure that that actually happens. So I think part of the reason we were talking about bringing it in front of the full committee so that the people who watch at home can mm -hmm. find out what we're actually working on and what we're doing that's mm -hmm. positive and interesting so it doesn't just kind of happen because the subcommittee meetings aren't usually televised. So that's right. just that that actually, that part of it gets happens, I guess. Mr. Moore? Yeah, I was thinking that uh, a big part of that really if, if we, it would be in how we structure our agendas that if we could put um, those kinds of reports 
which are not, there's not going to be any vote, there's not going to be any real discussion. It really is a presentation in most cases. If we could put that first in the agenda or immediately after public comment as opposed to how it has been in the past where it's been somewhere down in the list with making it very, again, inaccessible even not only for for the people making the presentation, but if you were somebody who actually turned on the TV to watch the thing, you'd have to muddle through a lot of relatively procedural stuff before you got to this presentation, which Thank might be of value to you. Okay, so we have a motion on the table to eliminate the curriculum committee, and given the debate I've heard, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote, um, just because I, uh, I suspect it will be close. So if we could do a roll call on that. Okay. <clears throat> to eliminate the curriculum committee, Ms. Budaval? No. Mr. Michael Flynn? No. Mr. Downey Meyer? No. Mr. Tyler Moore? Yes. Ms. Lisa Minnick? No. Mr. Finkett? Say no. Mr. Andrew Shelfo? No. Mr. Ed Zahowski? No. Mary David Narkowitz? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you sure? <laughs> I know, see? No. Uh, the motion does not carry. We had that roll call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Howard. Okay. So, uh, are there any other amendments? Um, I guess. Well, I guess I feel like I have to ask the question, which is just the. Um, it gets back to the whole issue of this appointment of subcommittees and why you would want to do that twice during a term, as opposed to, um, <coughs> how, you know, have to keep in mind the school committee term will be two-year term and. Um, again, I'm used to the city council where we do all of these things at the first organizational meeting. Uh, the committees are appointed within the first week and then they work for that term. And I guess the question is just why you'd want to do it. I don't believe that actually came as a recommendation. It came as a question for the board okay. to discuss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It actually, it also partly came because understanding that we were in the transitional period of implementing charter changes. You came to this board in January and said, we can just continue what you had before or you can reappoint. And if, I, if, if I'm correct, some people opted to move around. Mm -hmm. And it was the sense of, the, of, of, it was my sense, and I think the sense of the vice chair, that people appreciated the opportunity to move from one committee to another on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So that's why those two things, that's why there's a distinction between those two things. If the committee wants to, to subscribe to two year terms on subcommittees, that I'm. Yeah, I'm I was more, happy. my big concern was just there was this, um, the way that was structured under the old rules was basically we were without a budget and property committee for the month of January effectively every year because there was this weird limbo that happened because all the committees disappeared on December 31st and had to be reappointed. So that was the one, and especially now that we have a much earlier front-loaded process, that's critical time. So I guess it would just, yeah, it's just, it's a, most legislative bodies, committees are appointed for the term, like the House, the Congress, the Senate, you know, all that stuff. So it's, um, I just was, logistically I was trying to understand it because it, you know, it, I don't know how much movement there would be. Uh, but that was the one concern that I had was doing it in every year, uh, the first meeting in January. And, I, and I have no okay. no skin in the game here. So because it seems like you get elected. wants to make an amendment. You get elected, and then in January or maybe February you have your first meeting, but then by November or December you're going to have to start applying for what your new committees will be again because I have to appoint them in the first meeting in January. But, so it's going to give you about eight months on a committee and then take into account the summer where you may not meet as much. So it's, I don't know, I just don't know that it really, so anyway, that was just my, my impression of it. I don't feel particularly strongly one way or another. What I will say in my experience is that there isn't a lot of movement. People generally kind of stick to, have you ever been on anything besides curriculum? Mm -hmm. Budget and property. One year? Two? I don't remember. Yeah. Being I'm just going to say <laughs> most people stay, find the one that they like and choose to stay there. Yeah. Um, and but but sometimes and especially since we're going to have more um, we may have more turnover we don't really know on the board with elections every two years 
occasionally you get a mix of people on a subcommittee that might not be ideal, and it's it might be good to be able to correct that. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Not only they might not be ideal, but they might not like their position, and I don't want somebody in the position for two years not liking it. And also, um, on 2.2, .2 it says within, week, within one week following the first meeting of the calendar year. Um, I'm on the Rules and, Poli Procedure, Rules and Policy Committee, and I thought it had something to do with the organizational, after the first organizational meeting, so we didn't, I, because I remember that we talked about it quite extensively, that we didn't want to go, as the mayor was talking, into you know, when um, long, not having anybody for a month or something like that. So I didn't know if we had figured out some way to fix that so that there wasn't that la lapse. There, there hasn't been. We've, d we've generally had our meeting in January. The vice chair takes the has taken the requests. Um, right after the meeting, the letter goes out the next day and it's all named before the next meeting and the subcommittees start to meet. It was a change this year because we had the change in the charter and so there, there was this kind of, that was the limbo. It wasn't because of, of um, renaming the committees by so much as we didn't know what we were doing yet. So is it the first meeting then of the calendar year? Is it the first meeting, of the, I mean, with one week of the first meeting of the calendar year or, or one week after the first meeting, the organizational meeting, and is that the same thing? It was the first meeting of the year as the organizational meeting, as the organizational meeting, excuse me, I can't talk anymore, because inauguration happens at the beginning of January and then we meet the following week and people send in their requests, we name the committees and they start, budget usually meets right away. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think, I think there's misconception going around. There's actually a very clear distinction here. 1.2 says the first meeting following an inauguration shall be the organizational meeting at which we do these things. 1.3 says within one week fo following the first meeting of each calendar year, we're going to appoint these subcommittees and positions. And which is to say that we do not have an organizational meeting on the off year. We have an organizational meeting after an inauguration. The other year, all we're doing is appointing committees. To the mayor's point, it does leave us perhaps without um, intact subcommittees for some short period of time unless you interpret the rules and the law as saying that everyone serves in their original capacity until such time as they're replaced by someone else. So you could conceivably have a meeting the first week of January in the off year of the Budget and Property Committee that was the one that was from the year before. I think the biggest issue was whether or not we could have had an executive session and to the extent that we had to reorganize every year. This does allow us having an organizational meeting after an inauguration to continue having executive session bef before our meetings in the second year. We can't, ha on, the, on inauguration years, we can't have an executive session before the first meeting that we have that organizational meeting. Because you why? get all of that? Because why? <laughs> because we haven't organized. But you're a public body and you have in a chair. In most cases, so. the, well, I don't know. We haven't uh, appointed an executive secretary by then. We haven't, we haven't appointed. Okay. Well, we've I don't never, know that we'd we've have. We've never it. done it. We've never done it. We've never had an executive I don't know that we'd have an executive Prior session. to a meeting in January. That makes sense. But I, I would say that you could, if you interpret the rules as saying people serve until the replacements yeah. are. Well, the mayor has to be there at the first meeting. Then <laughs> I would think that you could go ahead and have, have chair. subcommittee meetings. Is the 11 p.m. rule still in here? Okay. I okay, got my I, eye on the clock. I, that's why. Okay, so I, I just raised that, <laughs> and I'm just sorry, but I, I, you know, again, if this, I if will someone, I, and I, again, I'm like stepping. I'm not wed to this thing. Yes. If someone else wants to make a motion for an amendment to change it so that we appoint subcommittees for two years, that's fine with me. You can see okay. if it flies. You could nudge somebody next to you, make them. It's fine. I, I, you know, I'll live with it. It, you know, it does present the interesting possibility that the. Budget and Property Committee that started crafting a budget won't be the same one that then in January there's a handoff to another Budget and Property Committee. I know you're shaking your head no, the, but, the budget property but the mayor decides about the budget. Well, but it's part of the, a but lot you know, of the vetting. It's going to happen the next year. Any, the same thing is going to happen the next year. 
when there's an election. You're right. So it's every two years, but then you have all new members, presumably. That's why you would do it every two years, because you presumably have a whole new set of, you don't we have a change not. of. Hopefully not two years. Well, no, but I'm just saying that that's why that's organizational why That's why I wasn't happy yeah. with the charter change anyway, because I think there needs to be some continuity on the school committee, so I hope some of these people are going to run again. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, I'll, I'll just drop it uh, <laughs> at that point, and we'll just proceed. Um, any other questions or amendments? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the rules of procedure of the Northampton School Committee as amended, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The rules are adopted. So we'll revisit these at our organizational meeting on January of 2014. Uh, okay, so is there any um, <laughs> new business we did? In turn, there's one question. There is a school committee meeting scheduled for Thursday, April 25th, which had been put aside as a budget, sort of a backup as a budget meeting if we needed another budget meeting. Uh, I don't have the sense that there's a need for that at this point. Yes. I'm curious if we should save the date just in case we need it in terms of the superintendent search. Well, that was process. going to be the question. Yeah. Um, so we can keep it there and then make a decision closer to if we want to cancel it, since it's been on people's calendars. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then obviously May 9th would be the regular meeting of May. Okay. To adjourn. Second. And all those in favor of adjourning, aye. say aye. Aye. All those aye. <laughs> Any abstentions? Oh. Okay.